Well, good morning, everyone. Um, let's give ourselves just another minute or two for some more folks to jump on. I think we've got a pretty good um, attendance so far. This is the Cascade Natural Gas uh, Conservation Advisory Group meeting, quarter one. So um, please hold on for another minute or two, and then we'll jump into our agenda. All right. It is 9.02, so I will <laughs> go ahead and proceed. Um, as I mentioned, welcome. This is our Cascade Natural Gas um, quarter one, first meeting of the year for our Conservation Advisory Group. Thank you, everybody, for your interest and your continued participation. We really appreciate it. I think um, that's what makes our, our program so valuable is to get that insight from so many different sources and, and helps us grow. And there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of, I don't want to say changes necessarily, but, but maturation that we're going to have this year um, with the biennial conservation plan um, it, for the first time, you know, having that, that two-year focus on the programs, I think it's really going to make a difference. Um, and I'm excited to, to see, you know, how, how the year goes. So, um, thank you. Welcome. Uh, so I will uh, jump into our agenda then. Um, I'd like to start um, by mentioning that we are recording the, the meeting. Um, if you'd like to, to be on video, please feel free. If you'd like to just be on video when you're talking, then um, that works too. Um, I would also like to go through our general introduction, so we'll do that shortly. In the meantime, I'll mention that uh, Desiree Bickmore is on the phone with us here. She is um, now taking over the role that Robin White used to do for us. So she is uh, recording the, the meeting for us. She'll be following up in a couple weeks um, with the synopsis and the, the video recording as we've been doing for the last year or so. Um, so from a logistics perspective, um, Desiree is our go-to. <laughs> Hi, Desiree, thank you so much. Um, and we'll, we'll do a little more with the introductions here shortly as well. Um, before I, I jump in, everybody should have a copy of the agenda. I, I sent that via email and I, I do apologize. We also sent a couple of uh, invites. Um, we were having trouble with the call-in information. Um, so I wanted to make sure everybody had the right um, information on that end. If you didn't get a copy of the agenda or if you have any questions, please reach out to uh, Desiree or myself and we'll make sure that we get you um, you know, all the resources that we have. Uh, so then in the meantime, I would like to um, do our introductions. We'll kind of uh, go through them. I know there's quite a few folks on the line. I think we've got about 22 people. So um, hopefully we can do this fairly quickly. I know um, also that uh, a couple of folks aren't going to be able to be on the call for the whole meeting. So I'm hoping um, we can get through our first section and then jump into low income because I know um, Sean Collins would really like to um, participate in the majority of that conversation and there's some pretty meaty topics that we want to try to get to so um, uh, on that front then I will start with introductions as I mentioned Monica Kalasha I manage our Cas um, Cascade Energy Efficiency Programs um, and I'm really excited for the year uh, I'd like to kind of go uh, looks like we have uh, alphabetically just because it's easy <laughs> So uh, I think, uh, Desiree, if you could just pipe up real quick for me. Okay, go ahead. Give, give a little background real quick. So my background uh, with the company is uh, I've been with MDU at the Customer Service Center since December of 2009. I started in the administrative role there in October of 2010 and was in that position for about 11 years. It's in Meridian, Idaho at the Customer Service Center and then... I'm now here. So I've been with the company a total of 12 years. Thanks, Desiree. Welcome to our team. Welcome to the advisory group. We're Thank excited you. to have you. All right. Uh, Lori, would you be so kind? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs and Energy Efficiency for Cascade. And um, just welcome to the meeting. And we appreciate you guys all, all joining today. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Uh, Carrie. Good morning. I'm Carrie Buren. I'm the uh, supervisor for energy efficiency and community outreach uh, in Monica's team. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, Mark Childs. Hi there. Good morning, everyone. Mark Childs, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Customer Service for Cascade. Thanks, Mark. Good morning. Um, Corey. I'm not sure if Corey might be having some problems. Mute? Sounds like maybe Corey's on mute. Um, Drop him a quick note. Well, we'll come back to Corey. Um, he's with Public Council. 
Um, so, uh, Ashton. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Ashton Michael Davis. I'm with Resource Planning at Cascade. Thanks, Ashton. Brady. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brady Day with TRC. We manage the commercial industrial program for um, the Cascade EE program. Thanks, Brady. Uh, Chris Fork. Good morning. Uh, this is Chris. I'm one of the energy analysts for Cascade Natural Gas placed in Bellingham. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Gil. Good morning, Gil. I think it's a little bit quiet on your end. I, I, we did hear that you said that you and Mark Thompson um, do projects occasionally for, for testing. Right. Uh, that's right. So that's that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gil. Um, you sound good now, by the way. <laughs> All okay. right. Uh, Mr. Cooney, welcome. Thank you for having me today. I'm a consultant with the Energy Project. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Liepa. Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Liepa, and I'm a policy contractor with the Northwest Energy Coalition. And thank you, Liepa. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Welcome. All right. Um, Sheila. Good morning. Sheila McElhinney, Senior Analyst, uh, Energy Efficiency on Monica's team. Thanks, Sheila. Devin. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Devin McGreal, Senior Resource Planning Analyst with Cascade. Welcome, Devin. Taylor. Good morning, everyone. Taylor Mead and I am a support specialist for Cascade Natural Gas. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, Heather. Can I just say my experience is that there are always a ton of M names, so I'm always like, oh, I'm next, and then there's five or six more people before I actually go. Um, anyway, Heather Moline, a uh, regulatory analyst with Utilities and Transportation Commission, and I'm the point person on our team for Cascade Conservation. So. This is one of my main hats that I wear, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Heather. Um, Jocelyn. Good morning. I'm Jocelyn Moore. I'm an energy efficiency support specialist with Cascade Natural Gas, and I echo Heather's uh, comment. There's always a ton of them names. Um, Mike. I'm Mike Parvinen, Regulatory Affairs with Cascade. Welcome, Mike. Um, Peter. Yes, hi. Uh, Peter Crystalite with NIA. I'm the Natural Gas Portfolio and Strategy Manager. Been with NIA now for about a half year now. So but this is what, third third CAG, I think? Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> old hat, old hat for you. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Uh, and Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie Reed, uh, Data Entry, uh, Monica's team for uh, Bellingham. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, did I miss anybody on our call? Oh, Liz, welcome. Hi there, Liz Reichart. Uh, I'm a senior energy policy specialist at Washington Department of Commerce, where I work on energy efficiency. So great to be here. Thanks, Liz. All right. Did I did I miss anybody else? Anybody pop on while I wasn't looking? Uh, yeah, oh, Alan. Sorry, right, Alan. No problem. Sean Collins here, uh, calling in from the phone. Sorry, I was having problems getting into the application. Oh, I apologize for that, Sean. Thank you so much for calling in. And Alan, I, I do apologize. You've been on the screen the whole time, and I'm just like blank. <laughs> I'm camouflaged. No. Camouflaged. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. Yeah. Energy efficiency uh, policy manager for Cascade. Thank you, Alan. And uh, John, Mr. Sorvik. Hey, thank you, Monica. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Uh, my name is John Storvik. I'm an energy efficiency analyst with the uh, Cascade Natural Gas EE department. And uh, yeah, looking forward to this meeting. Thank you, John. All right. After my faux pas, did I miss anybody else? Yeah, this is Corey from Public Council. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. I thought you were just doing Cascade introductions. That's why I didn't go off mute. <laughs> so I just haven't had enough coffee and um, I... I'm here and I, I was here before, so. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> um, welcome again to everybody. Um, I will take it from there then and we'll just jump into our agenda. Um, uh, let's see, we have our meeting uh, notes from last time. I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out my new headphones and I keep trying to pop out of my head. Um, okay, so, so <laughs> we have our meeting notes from last time. You should have the link. I also opened up a copy so we can, um, Take a peek at it as well here. 
Um, I did. It's not going to show up now. Those are tariffs, of course. Um, all right. I have to go back to it. Sorry. I was all prepared, too. That's the problem is I get overprepared and then... Um, <laughs> Well, we can look at the, the main takeaways in the meantime while this open. Well, there we go. I'll just do it this way, I guess. Um, as you guys know, we started uh, posting our uh, meeting notes and everything on our website. So this is just the link there. We've got our synopsis as well. We've got the videos down there. Um, if you ever have any questions, again, about the access for that, please let me know. Um, Desiree is going to be taking that role on for us. So I'm sure she'll be happy once she's a little more familiar with it to help as well. Uh, okay, so we had our main takeaways um, for this agenda. Sorry, I know I'm going back and forth. Um, so one of the action items was to send Amy, Andrew, and Heather um, a copy of our biennial conservation plan in Word. We did that. That's all done. Um, Sheila also sent Andrew a copy of the Washington Department of Commerce weatherization specifications. Um, and then Corey, the, the information we talked about, a, a project that had a lot of asbestos um, um, remediation for our low-income program. So we, we followed up on that. Um, Sean was also uh, working on the back end with the agency for that same project. I believe that's still pending, um, waiting for, for feedback from the agency. Sean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that was the follow-up that you'd provided. Um, and then uh, we, uh, we're going to include a topic on therm savings assumptions um, from Mia, um, and that's on this agenda. So very, very nice to see you, Peter. You look like a deer in headlights. Like, Wait a minute. What are we talking about? <laughs> um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. It's just how we're going to um, account for those savings um, through uh, the Mia programs for our annual reporting this year. And then um, we also um, sent along the CAG agenda. Um, excuse me, the, the CAG meeting uh, dates for this, this year. Um, so that part was done as well. So I will jump back into the, this was the synopsis from last time. Um, we talked about the quarterly update. We, um, you know, in, as part of that, we talked about the residential highlights. We talked about our commercial highlights, where we were at for the year. Um, spoiler, uh, they did uh, goals for the year. Yay, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work from commercials, a lot of work from our commercial folks, our, our residential folks. It's a big, big accomplishment. Um, so um, that's unofficial because we haven't done the annual report, but uh, we can tell you uh, as far as the therm savings that we, we did meet our portfolio level goal. So that's really exciting. Um, we talked about the biennial conservation plan. We talked about the conditions documents that were going to be coming out as well. We'll touch base on that today. Um, we talked about our tariff update that was going to be forthcoming again. We'll touch base on that again today. Um, we have a, a Bellingham building audit that we were um, working on. We might give a, a very, very short update on that today just on where we're at. And then, again, those quarterly meeting um, that schedule. So that was about it for the meeting last time. Do we have any questions or can I um, jump off of that and on to our current topics? All right. Sounds good. So I'm going to close that one out. We'll go back to our agenda. <laughs> All right, so quarterly update, that's um, Brady and I. So I'm going to hand it off to Brady, I'm willing Brady, to talk about our commercial highlights for quarter four. Yeah, so uh, quarter four was by far our strongest quarter. Um, we did expect, um, as we kind of expected, based on the, um, we had a very large custom project that completed in quarter four, but we had anticipated it would close a little bit sooner in the year. So. Uh, that project alone was 510,000 therms, um, and our quarterly or our yearly goal was 578,000 therms. Uh, so we finished the year on the commercial side uh, at 798,874 eight, 798, therms, um, a little over uh, or a little less than 40 percent over the goal um, for the program. Uh, in addition to the large custom project, we also continue to see growth in the standard projects. Um, we've talked about before the importance of having those uh, standard projects to build kind of the floor for the program. So uh, as we're a part of every conversation with businesses that um, are replacing furnaces or boilers or um, water heaters, things like that, the more we become a part of their planning, um, the more regular and more we can count on standard firms um, and not just relying on 
a you know large custom projects in order to achieve goal. Um, of course, that being said, uh, it did take a large custom project this year in order to achieve goal, but um, we did see uh, a pretty steady growth in um, 2021 on the standard side, um, about a 7% growth. So um, any questions on the numbers or the standard side specifically before we talk a little bit about our outreach? And then also a little preview of 2022. Yes, quick question. This is Heather yeah. from the UTC. Um, to do the graph um, commercial slash industrial therms achieved. That's that's slightly farther down. I think this might be a cascade question um, or for whoever put this graphic together. Uh, this the cascade natural gas 2021 target. Does it go up? by month? Like, why is it a slanting line as opposed to a straight line? Yeah, so it's kind of a, we we do make some project projections in terms of um, what months we anticipate based on kind of a three-year average of therm saved. Um, there is a quite a large bump there. You might see it in March where that was when initially where we expected that large custom project to close. So um, there was a huge bump in terms of the goals um, that we expected to achieve, uh, but obviously that project completed later in the year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, any other questions? I think Corey has his hand raised. Yeah, yeah, I'll just jump in here. Uh, this is Corey from Public Council. Um, so, I mean, obviously it's great that um, you achieved uh, the goal for the year and exceeded it, um, but obviously, the it's exceeding by a pretty high percentage. So, and, and I understand that's because it is the result of one large project closing. Um, so, I'm just wondering, is that um, why wasn't that included in the target, being it that it's you know 40% over the goal? If it was you know five ten percent. That's a little bit more wiggle room, but. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not asking this question well, but I hopefully you understand the intent. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, Corey, there's there's two things here. Um, Cascade knew this project was coming last year, right? And and it was actually supposed to close last year. It didn't. Um, keeping keeping that in mind, um, we when we did our contract with Brady's team uh, last year, we took what um, uh, load map ha had had said was our, our goal for the year. Um, and then in, in contracting with, with our, our vendor, um, sorry, I don't mean to refer to you as a vendor, Brady. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> general <okay. laughs> um, in, in, in contracting with um, another entity to make sure that they did um, try to, to keep momentum and not just, um, shall we say, fall back on, on a project that we knew was, was likely to complete anyway. Um, we, we based our, our paid per performance um, contract with them to try to, to to not just meet goal, but to go above and beyond because we knew that this project was coming. Um, so the the contract that we did with with Brady's team um, had goals that were set on a quarterly basis outside of the standard goal that you saw from from load map. Um, so we did actually have an aspirational goal as well, and and. Brady's team got close to it. We didn't actually meet the aspirational goal, um, mostly because of the way that um, the, you know COVID affected the um, um, shortages in, in um, supplies and, and you know that kind of thing. I mean, Brady can speak to that a little bit more. Um, so we, we did plan for it from that side. When it comes to load map, load map actually doesn't do a great job of, of identifying some of these huge project opportunities. I mean, they're much more customizable. Um, they are included from a general sense, but um, we we did not like go back and revise um, the specific goal from load map based on the single project that was coming through. Um, but that's not, I mean, load map is supposed to include basic assumptions on, on um, you know, deemed assumptions for, for projects um, for the commercial industrial program. So it's not, not part of the, the program that we go above and beyond unless we're talking about like a transport customer and and that's kind of a different um that's a different conversation and i would add to the the goal for 2021 um was about 200,000 terms higher than the goal for 2020 was um so it you know it it wasn't a hedge it was based on the numbers but it, it there was you know had the had there been a slower progression in terms of um goals for 2021 versus 2020 um 
it would have been even a higher, uh, more than, you know, much more than 38% of her goal. Yeah, that's a good point, Brady. I'm sorry, I didn't even think about the, the goal last year versus this year. Um, yeah, the last year was 387 and this year was 578. So it was about 200,000. And then this year it's for 2022, it's around 419. So, okay, that's, that's good to know. It's just, you know, when targets are exceeded by that much, it, we have to wonder if target was set too low. No, that's absolutely fair, Kerry. Thank you. Yeah, question. Any other questions on um, Q4 or 2021 review of the numbers? Cool. Um, so we also, as a program, um, have been trying to identify hard to reach communities. Um, one of the things we did was bring on someone who um, works out of our Portland office uh, on the Energy Trust of Oregon program and have um, him cover the Longview, Kelso, a kind of Southern territory that's a little bit geographically isolated from the rest of CNG's territory. Um, to work, uh, so that's we've identified that as a hard to reach market, um, and are are continuing to see growth in that area. It hasn't been as much as we anticipated, but um, that area in particular has been partially hard to reach because the economics in that area have not, um, you know, continued to grow at the pace elsewhere. So uh, we do believe we'll see some more in 2022. Um, just based on investment in time, uh, meeting with trade allies. Um, uh, the gentleman who works in that area has developed a really good relationship with a lot of business owners, um, spends a fair bit of time uh, in the territory, whether that's on the phone or email, um, as most of our outreach has been throughout 2021 uh, or in person. Um, so that's one hard to reach market that we identified um, back in 2020 uh, and have invested um, resources in. Additionally, we have identified the Spanish speaking market um, as an area that we could, um, you know, get more aware, more program awareness and try to break down some of those barriers of, um, you know, maybe the program is a little bit far afield for um, folks. And so what we've done is we've done some advertising um, the uh, newspaper in uh, newspaper in Yakima, and then also some radio advertising in the trace advertising, excuse me, in the Tri Cities area. Um, as those two areas, the radio advertising actually reaches a little bit closer to Yakima in the valley there, but also does reach Walla Walla. So um, we haven't seen a huge uptake um, yet from those, but I think that's something that we're going to continue to sustain in 2022. Um, and continue to focus on um, as we believe there is opportunity there that um, we have missed out on in the past. Um, and then the last kind of initiative that we focused on in 2021 was the recovery initiative. Um, recovery was a, um, <laughs> maybe it should be for 2022 as well, but um, the idea was as businesses are coming out of COVID, um, there might be an opportunity for investment, whether that's new owners investing in new equipment or um, building envelope investments, things like that, uh, or just, you know, as restaurants come out of the pandemic and are looking for um, new opportunities to be prepared for, you know, hopefully an emerging economy, um, we would offer an additional 10% in savings for customers who installed three or more measures. So initially the idea was, okay, well, you're replacing a fryer, but why not look at a water heater and look at your heating um, apparatus as well, or HVAC unit. Um, but, you know, it, it kind of became something that we wanted to promote across the board. So if you have one fryer go out, maybe you have two other fryers that are close, why not reinvest and purchase three fryers or something like that. So um, we saw an additional $8,277 in incentives go out specifically over that or for that recovery initiative. Um, so pretty good success. I think we anticipated it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $10,000. So um, again, that $10,000 would represent or the $8,277 would represent um, $82,770 in um already incentives that, that customers were receiving and the 8,277 was additional. Um, so pretty good success with that. Um, maybe not as quite as much as we anticipated, but again, um, as we're all 
on teams and not in person. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's the, the pandemic continued to impact, um, I think, investment in a way that that we probably didn't anticipate going into 2021, um, but certainly can look back on now and, and understand. Any questions on those initiatives? OK, uh, and I know this is a look back at um, quarter four um, and not necessarily a look into 2022, but I just quickly so, wanted to. Oh, go ahead. Brady, let me let me. Um take the egg off my face and clarify. <laughs> um, so the last bullet here, this this is my fault. It, Brady gave me the right information and has somehow deleted one of the words. Um, TRC has identified roughly half of the um, uh, therm savings for, for this year um, so far in, in actual projects. So um, it's not it's not the full 419,000 so far. It's about half of them. So that, that's my fault. I deleted the, the word half. Um, I, I don't know how, but I apologize but, that that got into the final version. Sorry, Brady, go ahead. Oh, no worries. Um, so we're at about, uh, in terms of therms identified specifically for projects, um, about 226,000 therms uh, identified for uh, 2022 in terms of uh, specific projects. So this is not a, um, okay, X percentage growth in standard and, you know, I mean, we anticipate a decline in custom because we don't see a 510,000 therm project coming down the road. But um, so it's not based on that. It's based on specific projects that we've already identified. And those 226,000 therms, um, we only use projects that we've identified with about 75% certainty. So um, these are pretty likely projects to complete in 2022. Um, and yeah, so I don't want to spend too much time on that because I know we're more looking back than looking forward, but um, just kind of an idea on um, what our outreach in 2021, including Q4, um, has yielded for the future. And I think that's it for me. Um, as yep, Heather noted, that's... there are some other graphs that talk specifically about the um, the growth in 2022 or or 2021 excuse me the results um but i think that's a, about it i guess i would highlight um this <laughs> this commercial industrial therms by measure type is very skewed um with that custom other um but we saw another year of growth in terms of boilers um as being our biggest non-custom measure uh from 2021 and I don't anticipate that would be something that will um, fall off significantly. Uh, I think we'd probably anticipate it being around the same, um, maybe a slight dip or a slight increase, but um, high efficiency condensing boilers continue to be uh, a big driver of the program. Thank you, Brady. Any questions on the commercial industrial program Q4? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into residential. I'm going to try not to spend too much time so we really can get into our low income program. Um, on the residential front, uh, we saved 428,657 therms this year um, through the end of, of November. There uh, was an additional about 2.5% in December, so this does not include December the way with um, this meeting hitting before really the mid month. Um, we didn't have a chance to um, calculate out all of December as well. but. Essentially, Cascade got about 93% of our residential goal um, based on, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, that is strictly on rebate processing for, for the program. There was a slowdown in, in um, submitted applications at the end of the year, and we were hearing from our trade allies um, that it was they, they really were having um, trouble getting a hold of the uh, energy efficient equipment the, to, to install for the customers. So there were a lot of customers who were actually um, not able to have projects performed in December um, because the equipment just wasn't available. So I, I think that was part of it. We do think that that had an impact um, kind of preventing us from being able to get 100% of the residential goal. Um, again, at the portfolio level, we met our portfolio level. Um, and then one of the conversations is when we look at our, our NIA savings, um, you know, how are those going to be attributed to the program? Um, if based on the estimates that we received from, from NIA, there was um, 
almost 150,000 therms on the residential front. Um, so if you can calculate even a, a portion of that towards um, to, to make up the difference, um, we would easily make the residential goal based on the um, code changes and everything from the end. So that's not set in stone. Obviously, we're going to have a conversation about that. Um, and those those savings are not yet guaranteed. Um, NIA hasn't gotten their final numbers out, but um, definitely uh, we will have met our residential goal based on, on those in included. So um, any questions on, on the bullets for the residential program? There's a pretty significant update, or not update, excuse me, increase from the previous year. Um, you know, our goals were significantly higher for the residential program. So we, we did have a 14% increase um, compared to the three-year average, 29% more applications were processed. There's a lot of applications every single month, every single week this year, or last year, I guess. Um, we were pushing to get those applications processed through so that we could meet our goals. Um, it, it was an immense amount of work to keep up to meet that level of, of um, savings. Uh, and then, of course, as I mentioned, the concerns with the supply chain um, seriously did delay um, some of the installs in, in November, December. We also, um, you know, to the adaptive management front in November, tried uh, to, to put two different um, programs into place to really drive additional um, application submittals. One of them was uh, recognizing our, our veterans. So we had an additional, um, you know, bonus coupon, essentially. Um, for, for veterans to make sure that they installed that higher efficiency equipment. And then we had a trade ally bonus. We called it a TAP bonus, where the trade ally themselves would be eligible for, um, let's call it a SPIF, essentially, um, if they got those applications in. Um, so, you know, get those high efficiency measures in and get those applications in as quickly as possible so that we could really um, get a good grasp on what was actually being installed or not. Sometimes there's a delay from our contractors or even the customers in getting their applications in. Um, Despite the push for you know two different things in November, we still didn't see an increase in November. There was a decrease, and we really think that is attributable um, to the supply chain issues. So, just kind of gives you. Heather, I think Heather has a question, Monica. Thanks, Carrie. Go ahead, Heather. Uh, thanks, Monica. I'm hearing a, a couple things here. The first is, I guess I want to clarify what you mean by based solely on rebate processing, because um, it sounds like you know, you're doing these big pushes and you've increased the efficiency with which you process applications for rebates. Are you saying if you had been able to process rebates faster than you would have reached the goal? Um, so we did receive a batch, a large batch of projects in mid-December. Um, if we had not had vacations, if we hadn't had a holiday, um, it's possible we would have gotten very, very close to, you know, within 1% of meeting the goal. Um, we, I did not make the team, um, you know, spend uh, OT during Christmas to, to get those in. So to that point, yes, um, we, we could have gotten very, very, very close for that. Um, what I was more referring to, though, is the um, the savings through the NIA efforts. Um, and I know that there's a regional discussion on, you know, whether those actually should or should not be attributed to the programs themselves um, or if they need to be counted separately. If we if we can count some of those savings, uh, you know, we've, we've been working with NIA for the past, um, I don't know, seven, seven and a half years. I guess it's eight years now. Um, if we can account for any of those savings really from the residential program, and those are from code changes, um, then um, that would we would meet our residential goal. Gotcha. So it it sounds like three factors so far that you've identified here. The first is um, vacations are important, and the timing of uh, this large amount of applications all at the end wasn't great. Um, the second is question of whether NIA savings can be uh, counted on. And then the third is supply chain issues. Is that right? Um, yeah, that's that's three of them. I, I think it's kind of oversimplifying the vacations, but yes, <laughs> um, re resourcing, let's say, resourcing in general. Um, but, but really, I mean, we can only process so many um, when a large batch comes through at once. So, yeah. Yep, poor joke on my part. I didn't, I didn't mean to say. <laughs> Gosh darn it, vacations are important. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it.
Um, I'm I'm really impressed with how much we got through this year. That's that's more residential savings than we've ever gotten through in my knowledge. I, I'd have to double check it, but um, just the amount of work that it took to get through, um, you know, the all, all yeah, it, it it is an immense amount of, of effort on the team's part to be able to process through as much as we did. So I I am not um, I I wouldn't have changed anything. I'm so proud of my team. So thank you. Any other questions on the residential front? Um, we've got the, uh, you know, the forecast of what we had thought we might get close to, and then what the current terms were. This is, of course, through November. Um, next, uh, we'll, we'll, next quarter, you know, we'll have the final one so that you can actually see it because we're going to actually do the annual report as well. But this was just forecasting through November, and then um, obviously, like I said, December we only got about another 2.5 percent on the residential front, um, but got through, you know a lot of other um, things that were pending as well. So. Uh, more, a, go ahead, Heather. Yep. Question, yep, Heather from UTC on residential front. So this might be, again, me getting used to um, 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 what Brady was saying about, you know, the target that you submit to the UTC is different from let's make sure we're on track to our goal. So we're going to project um, expectations by month. Um, so I guess my question is here, this residential therms goal pie chart um, 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 is different from the residential therms achieved by month graph for 2021. So yeah, can you explain to me the difference between um, 469956 um, and down here 428657? Like what what what's what are the differences between these graphs, I guess? Uh, yeah, sure I can. And and I might ask um, Jocelyn to kind of pipe up and make sure that I'm uh, clear in the way that I'm explaining it. So the, the the teal part in this bottom graph is what we have actually paid. These are the terms that we have actually paid out. Um, the, um, the the green part here or the, the lighter green part is what we estimated was available within our queue. So those projects that were still sitting waiting waiting to be processed, there's about 10,000 at that point. And then um, therms to goal is, is the gap, let's say, of, of what we didn't have in, in the bucket um, to fill up to, to meet the goal of the 471,000. Um, this earlier chart, when you're looking at the residential, ugh, pardon me, residential therms achieved by month, um, the forecasted therms is what we were forecasting based on our processing time, um, processing uh, cadence, how many we were processing per per week, I think. Um, Jocelyn, go ahead and, and weigh in. I think you probably yeah. can do that one better. So this first graph is kind of the forecasted therms based on, like Monica was saying, processing time. It doesn't really take into account if the uh, number of applications are there to process it is just saying if the re if the raw resources are there to process this is what we can do the pie chart the 20 under residential therms goal the if if you see the the accomplished therms are the same this uh, chart was created before that final or that big builder batch came in that's part of the reason that the estimated therms in queue is only 10,000 whereas that builder batch would have added closer to 30 or 40,000 therms if we could have processed it this is not taking into account uh the processing it is just saying this is what we've accomplished this is what we currently have in the goal at time of uh the report being created and this is how much we have to go it, it doesn't forecast, whereas the other one is forecasting what we can achieve, assuming that the um, applications come in. Um, the, it is inaccurate This for what has occurred. This was created for, the, uh, uh, for November. The residential numbers are through November, um, not December like uh, Brady's numbers. So those forecasted terms are 
not reflective of what we're pretty sure is going to come in at the end through uh, rebate processing alone. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I might have a follow up question based on once we get to portfolio as a whole out of residential, sure. but I'll I'll save it for then. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, so I will then uh, move down to the portfolio. <laughs> um, so we faced uh, 1.24 million therms this year, uh, which exceeded the portfolio goal. Um, again, we this is this is what um, uh, Brady was mentioning about 200,000 over therm, 200,000 therm. Oh my gosh, 200,000 therm over um, the 1.05 million portfolio level goal. So um, on residential or unofficial actuals, again, this actually is going looking towards um, December. We are we did um, forecast out a little bit to December. Um, despite what Jocelyn had just said, because we didn't have all the other numbers for November, um, from November on, but we do know essentially the therm savings. So we're estimating 441,000 residential therms. Um, commercial was 798,000, so total was 1.2. Um, on the low-income front, our goal was about 12,000, um, and we received, um, we achieved about 8,000, a little over 8,000 therms. Um, so did, did you have a question about that, Heather? Yes. Um... So just looking at the 2021 conservation plan, um, the total portfolio total therm target for 2021 is 1.06 million. So 1,061,827. Um, what, what's the difference here between this number and, and the number in this report? Did, did we add the low income to that? Yeah. And it's so it's not very different, right? One one million sixty one thousand eight hundred twenty seven for residential, commercial, industrial, and low income. And this is one point oh five. Um, which one's what? The the one point the one point oh four nine plus the twelve the low income is one point oh six one eight two seven. Oh, okay. We, I just, we pulled low income out separately from it. Great. Okay. Um, got it. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Um, so um, we'll obviously have more information on the, the annual report and everything. Um, we have our Q2 meeting before the annual report is due. So we'll weigh in more with the advisory group as we um, do the, the reconciliation and everything on the back end. Um, and there's, We'll talk about the annual report here a little bit more too, um, further along in the agenda. So are there any other questions about our quarter four achievements? Um, I'd, I'd love to jump into the low income weatherization if we can, but I'm happy to, of course, um, field any questions. Okay, I don't think I'm hearing anything. I did just get a notice saying that Teams wasn't hearing me. Are you guys hearing me okay still? Yep, yeah, can hear yes. you. Okay, it's pretty good. <laughs> Pregnant silence, I guess, is what it was. So, all right, thank you so much. Um, Let's let's go into the low income weatherization um, section. Alan, are you uh, available to speak to that? I know I wanted to make sure that Sean had an opportunity to weigh in on any of these specific topics he needs to. Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem. And I was going to let uh, Sheila lead the first half with our achievements for the year. And then once we got up to the uh, agency MOUs, I was going to uh, jump in on that. Uh, does that work for you, Sheila? Yeah, that's fine. Great. So um, we we achieved 37 homes. That's I, I consider it a success with the combination of COVID supply chain issues um, and everything else. So we achieved 85% of the 2020 projects. Um, we had participation from an agency that had never uh, participated in the program before. So I consider that a success as well. And currently, the Housing Authority of Skagit County is weatherizing some multifamily complexes in uh, Cedro Woolley. They're actually owned by the King County Housing Authority, and um, that will be our first multifamily uh, project for Whippy Whip. Um, the table speaks to itself. Uh, we have a total project cost with agency admin of six hundred and sixty three thousand seven hundred and sixty two dollars 
So does anybody have any questions about our our Q4 achievements or anything about the program? Well, Al. All right. It's teed up to update to agency MOUs. Take it away. OK, thank you. So uh, we're going to be circulating out uh, by the end of this month a fresh MOU to each of our agencies because um, we like to have the MOU in place and uh, updated for the uh, full uh, program year. Uh, you know, previously it was a little bit different. Each of the uh, agencies had been kind of on their own cycle, but uh, starting last year we were able to synchronize everybody up, but we did want to wait for one change uh, that we wanted to vet by our advisory group before we sent out the uh, fresh MOU. And that was just one small modification that was requested by some of our agencies uh, regarding uh, low income certification. So in our tariff, we defer to our agencies uh, to income qualify uh, a customer of the program. And uh, we, we think that's fine and we understand the standards that they're following. Uh, but in the MOU itself, uh, we specify, uh, I, th I think it was uh, the standard 60% um, of median income or 150% of poverty. Uh, so uh, a few of our agencies wanted clarification on that, that if there were other standards that they were allowed to use, whether that is the um, standard through the Department of Commerce or it is the standard from Housing and Urban Development, um, if that would be acceptable. And as far as I'm concerned, from my perspective, as long as they're following a, a state or federal standard for uh, qualifying uh, individuals as eligible for the programs, especially since um, the work that AEG performed on our behalf indicated that there is a higher pool of folks that are between the uh, commerce standard and um, still below median income. So if there's another standard that is state recognized, I don't see any reason uh, why we would tell the agency that they couldn't honor that. And so in the uh, MOU for this year, uh, we just wanted to change language to something along the lines of what you see, that the agency certifies the income uh, received by all household members, and it's consistent with state or federal income limits for programs serving low-income customers. And so I, I would love some feedback on that. And then uh, once we uh, get approval or uh, other recommendations, we'll fold those in and uh, get that MOU out to our agencies. Hi, Al. This is Sean. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Um, Happy New Year. Um, you know, just specific to this contract term, you know, I think this is, you know, um, something I, I support, you know, in recognition of the state Clean Energy Transformation Act setting you know, low income at 80% of area median income or 200% of federal poverty level, which commerce has allowed the use of matchmaker funds to that limit. Um, you know, that is that is the, the state law, you know, the, the federal income guidelines max out at 200% of federal poverty level. But I think this will provide the flexibility needed to use state funding where appropriate uh, for projects that benefit uh, Cascade Natural Gas customers. All right. Uh, yeah, so if there's uh, no other uh, comments or uh, feedback on that, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold that into the MOU and I'm going to get that out to our agencies uh, as soon as possible uh, so that uh, they've got the uh, full uh, contract for uh, CY22. And uh, then uh, just uh, to confirm, we are going to be uh, setting a meeting uh, within Q1 uh, to kick off the year with our agencies and I've uh, reached out to Sheila on that and I think she's going to be reaching out to the agencies. So that'll be uh, coming soon. Okay, um, any other uh, thoughts on the MOU before we move on to the tariff changes? All right, if somebody can scroll down for me. Somebody uh, maybe a little bit more. <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. 
OK, so all of these tariff changes, I appreciate this is the first time that you're seeing it. So this is the preview before uh, we would circulate red lines out to the advisory group. And I appreciate, Sean, that your time is uh, limited today. So I'll try to get through them as quickly as possible. But there will be uh, other opportunities uh, to look through this as well. Uh, but just wanted to vet in advance. Uh, some of the changes are going to be um, designed to align us with the requirements of the biennial uh, conservation plan. And then some of them are based on feedback from our agencies. Uh, so the first is uh, adjusting the, uh, this was an agency request, adjusting the uh, 1.0 savings to investment uh, ratio requirement to align with the exemptions allowed by the Department of Commerce in the weatherization manual. So there, there's a few places, um, and Sheila may be able to speak more to this as well, but as I understand it, there are a few exemptions uh, either through the priority list or otherwise in the uh, Department of Commerce weatherization manual that say that certain measures can have a, a savings to investment ratio of under 1.0 if the rest of the portfolio is cost effective. And uh, we, we want to be mindful of uh, maintaining cost effectiveness for the portfolio as a whole. And uh, we have had projects come in because we're not, it's only on the front end that we're looking at. We're looking at the anticipated cost effectiveness of a project. But at the end, uh, the overall cost can be a little bit higher than anticipated. And we're not going back and policing that but it's just the reality of the program. And so we're kind of thinking through how do we accommodate the agencies because there was that request to consider um, certain measures that are kind of falling below that 1.0. So how do we accommodate that uh, while still making sure that we're being mindful of overall cost effectiveness? And so have some proposed wording, just kind of floating it out there uh, we don't necessarily have to get approval word for word for it today, but the gist of it is that we can consider exemptions to the um, 1.0 requirement. If it's consistent with the weatherization manual, that's the first condition. And the total project as a whole, um, as estimated, you know, on the front end when they provide the estimate of what it's going to be, the total project as a whole is cost effective and the agencies themselves just because sometimes things do go a bit over but if an agency isn't doesn't have a trend of wildly exceeding um anticipated costs they're pretty reliable and they're not going over say 120 percent of what they anticipated that project cost would be in uh you know for a 12-month period we say yeah you know they're they're doing a great job anticipating what the costs are it's consistent with the weatherization manual, and it's not going to bring the project under a, a 1.0 savings to investment ratio. I, I don't see why we wouldn't support it, but I would love uh, some feedback from the group on that. And if that makes sense, or if we think that's too convoluted. Um, Alan, uh, this is Gil, uh, PH, I'm one of the consultants that the company sometimes uses. I think it's a very reasonable perspective. I mean, you always have to balance between um, wanting to provide the service and facilitate the agency when they're working hard with cost control. And it seems to me this is a very reasonable way to achieve that balance. Um, I, I wanna add that um, there are evaluators who are um, wanting to evaluate projects um, under federal contracts who don't understand that the purpose of weatherization is not to maximize cost effective results and want to do um, uh, experiments on um, on homes so that um, they will maximize the return on the dollar on pure conservation 
results rather than the overall things which include health and safety and um, other social goals that the state has and the company might have. Um, so I just want to say that as a caution that um, if these people are successful at the federal level in uh, winning under the new um, evidence-based policy law, and then they then they get to do this for uh, the federal government instead of it being run out of Oak Ridge with uh, people who understand the programs, then we might be running into that in the future. But but I think in reality this is a very good uh, balance you've got here. Um, this, this is Sean Finnerty. Uh, just, just to add a little bit to what Gil just mentioned, you know, I think what we're working with here in Washington State is uh, the utilization of federal dollars where they make sense. So, for example, uh, the income limits for the federal dollars are more restricted than the state limits. The state funds and utility funds have less restrictions about who can be served as low income and eligible. So, um, I think we're, we're continuing to see that here in Washington where we have resources generated within the state um, that are more flexible than what the federal dollars are able to provide. And so the agencies are able to weave those dollars together when it makes sense for all of those to be brought to bear. Um, but you know, the, the greater the flexibility to serve customers, the better off the, you know, the customers are in the long run. So I think you know, that's just something to keep in mind. And so do you feel, Sean, that this language uh, provides that sufficient flexibility or is there anything that you would recommend here? Um, yeah, I need to spend some more time with it. Um, honestly, I, you know, this is, I haven't had a, a chance to really uh, dig into it, so I, I don't see any concerns with it uh, initially here. Fair enough. Uh, let's see, so the other change that we're uh, looking at, this ties to the um, biennial conservation plan, but there was some language, uh, it looked like uh, there was a of 30 percent of funding for expenses associated with project coordination that it would be funded up to a maximum uh, program average of 30 percent or at least that it would be funded to 30 percent and because there was the word project coordination uh, at first we we just weren't clear if that was on top of the additional um the the 10 percent bringing that to 40 percent or no 15 percent uh which would bring it up to to 45 percent of total project or if that was looking at those two pieces 15 and or 10 no it was 10 and 15 yeah uh 25 and bumping it up to 30 or if we were going to 40. uh but it looks to me um in just some conversations that we've had with staff that the total a pro co coordination fee, administration, all of that would be a maximum program average of 30%, which means it's going to be effectively 30% uh, project uh, coordination fee to the agencies uh, per project. And uh, that seems reasonable to me at the 30%. I wasn't sure if that was intended to be higher than 30%, but Assuming that it does max it at 30%, this is uh, what we propose. The proposed wording is Alan, on the screen. Uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify for everybody. They probably know that, but essentially this is 5% more than what we're currently doing. Yes. So right now it's a 10 and a 15 um, combined 25, and this is just increasing it by about 5%. And that is in line for the conditions document and discussions with staff. That's in line with um, what PSE is doing as well, I, to my understanding. Yeah, so um, this is Sean. The PSC, Avista, and Pacific Power are all on the 30%, which breaks down to essentially a 10% indirect rate and then a 20% project coordination. Um, and then per our, I don't know, settlements from and the commission order from maybe you know, five years, four years ago, I don't, I don't have it off, off the top of my mind. Uh, PSC sits at a 15% project coordination, 10%. Uh, agency indirect rate. Um, so this 
this change would bring it in line with four, uh, well, it would be four of the five utilities. We're still with Northwest Natural has it, you know, still working through uh, some some changes with the company. So. Yep, and I see Heather has her hand up. This is where I confess that this this question um, that was fielded not just to me, but to Andrew and Deborah also, I don't fully understand what we're doing here, um, which is important for me to know because uh, it's written in the conditions. So what is the difference between the indirect rate and project coordination? Sure, I can I can break that down for you. So an indirect rate is the agency uh, basic cost of business, uh, HR, insurance, you know, rent, just like what it takes to keep the lights on and, you know, pay for an annual audit and, you know, run run insurance. Well, actually, that's that's more than a labor cost. But so it's, it's the, essentially the basic cost of doing business. We call it an indirect rate. Some agencies have a federally approved indirect rate. Others um, have uh, a rate, and ten percent, I think, is is modest for for an indirect rate. If you if you look, you know, um, and do some, do some analysis, I think you find that that's reasonable. And then project coordination is the specific expenses associated with going out, uh, identifying the customer, doing the income eligibility, doing an energy audit, bringing on contractors, facilitating the project, doing an inspection completing the test out, filling out the paperwork for cascade, and then coordinating the distribution of funds to contractors and the reimbursement requests to the utilities, to the commerce, et cetera. So those are all the direct costs associated with the, with coordinating a project. The indirect cost is just the cost of keeping the lights on uh, and such. Is that is that helpful? Yes, thank you very much. And um, Desiree, we want to make sure that that's captured in the notes. What uh, uh, Sean just clarified, um, the indirect rate costs, or, or um, I don't want to say fees, costs, expenses, let's say, um, versus the project coordination. And um, just for, for definition's sake, project coordination is also administrative costs. I think that question is for Sean. <laughs> Yeah, and what, what I sought to do by distinguishing indirect from direct is to move away from admin because it's such a nebulous word um, that it can, you could argue admin is part of HR expenses and admin is part of, you know, submitting uh, invoices for the, a direct project cost, uh, a cost a directly to a typical the project. So I'm, I would trying to distinguish direct costs from indirect costs so we can move away from the general admin term because I just don't think it's as specific as we need it to be in, in this case. And I think that's what had been the, I guess, sort of the choice word for a number of years. Um, I just thought it deserved more specificity for, for how, um, you know, the utility is paying invoices, how the agencies are invoicing for which costs just to, to create some more um, clear understanding. Thank you for that clarification. That helps me a lot. Thank you. I see another hand raised, but I'm not sure whose it was. Or if um, the hands just haven't been lowered yet. But did anybody else have any uh, questions or comments about the uh, the indirect rate? OK. Uh, so the next one, this isn't related to the uh, BCP, but it is something that's come up periodically. And uh, Monica and I were discussing uh, the timing of certain changes uh, to the weatherization WIPI WIP tariff. And, um, you know, if some of these we, we address, we'll need to address sooner than later because it's associated with the Biennial Conservation Plan. But there, there are some additional pieces that we may want to consider either now or later down the road. And one of them has come up oh, over the course of probably um, last year or so. And that was thinking about merging the eWhip and WIP program as a singular program uh, to, to better streamline uh, rebate processing and just to make it a little bit more straightforward. And the reason why it was eWhip and WIP is because it modeled the um, Oregon program 
with the our OLIEC program and then our cap tariff and the the cap the conservation assistance uh, tariff uh, bridge the gap between what could be traditionally funded under a weatherization program, which was strictly the avoided cost of of natural gas, and we we could only uh, pay that, and that bridged the gap so that the total installed cost of the measures uh, could be covered. And so, in the state of Oregon, uh, that was how um, OPUC staff was comfortable uh, with us funding a larger portion of the program uh, beyond the traditional avoided cost savings. And so that that was what the function of that separate piece was. I, I think it was a little bit different in Washington, but we were mirroring the spirit of the traditional program versus bridging the gap with the additional total installed costs that were above and beyond just pure energy savings. And so it's been discussed previously uh, whether it's needed to have both WIP and EWIP, or if we wanted to merge that together into um, combined uh, tariff language. And for the sake of our program reporting, uh, report that as lump and not separate it out. Uh, same for the rebate application that we circulate to our agencies. Uh, so I'm curious if anyone um, has any further thoughts on that, if that's something that we feel is appropriate to explore at this time, or if we're um, comfortable with the way it's laid out for now. Uh, hi, Alan, this is Sean. I'm just chiming in here real quick. You know, I think there is some uh, utility, no pun intended, in uh, merging the programs for simplicity's sake and would be interested in, you know, further discussing that, uh, that effort because, you know, I vote for uh, easiest way of, of doing things and it seems like that uh, would be a worthy uh, endeavor, potentially. Yeah, in that yeah. case, oh, I see Monica, you're weighing in. Sorry. I, I was just to say that could pair really well with um, the updates that I think we need to do, um, you know, once we get the final analysis comparison between what the savings are that we're currently assuming and what the conservation potential assessment um, cl clarified as far as savings per measure type. Um, we haven't had a chance to really get into that analysis yet. And if we can simultaneously do that and then um, revise that the, the the way that we're doing the WIP, <laughs> I didn't do it either way, WIP, EWIP um, calculation um, and, and simplify that form, uh, I, I think that would be a really good parity there to kind of reintroduce the program after that. Obviously, no gap in service, of course, but just um, kind of simplify and, and clarify what those savings assumptions are as well. Yeah, and that was more or less what I was about to say, too, because I remember we had discussed that, Monica. Uh, any other thoughts about that piece or approach uh, before I move on to the next item? I think just to note, Alan, oh, sorry, this is Heather from UTC. Um, I don't know if I have an opinion currently, but definitely going to see the merits of it and definitely going to mull over it with, with staff. Sounds good. I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, before Sean jumps off. There is a tariff discussion a little bit later in the agenda. Um, we do have some changes that need to be made in the more immediate future to the low income program, as, as Alan said, um, relating to um, the conditions document. So um, the, the, the plan right now is to make those changes, um, the, the more immediate required changes, and then to do a second tariff change for the low income program this year to accommodate the additional things that we're talking about. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking there's going to be two this year for the low income program. And, and okay, we can map that out to avoid confusion too, uh, so that when we're sharing things out with the CAG, you see what we intend to uh, change immediately versus what we're just trying to get some pre-work done for because we believe it is a priority, but uh, it may take a little bit longer uh, than the period that we have for the immediate compliance with the BCP. Um, I, this is Sean, I, I have to ju jump off here. So, so the changes you're discussing for the conditions, um, can, can we, well, I, I just haven't had time to, to spend on that, so I'm just not familiar with what those need to be. Uh, so Keith will be remaining on the line and perhaps we can have a offline discussion to follow up on that, uh, just so I can orient myself to what those are. Yeah, and we'll we'll separate them out clearly for you and Keith, Sean. Uh, but 
mainly that's going to pertain to the um, the uh, project coordination and uh, uh, indirect rate. That's okay. one piece. Um, and then the, the few yeah. items that we're about to talk about, too, with the um, uh, just clarifying the, the last three bullets here that I was about to talk about. But I will make sure that I separate it into two clear lists for you, uh, Sean and Keith, so that you um, see what we're approaching when. Okay, yeah, I can hang on for another couple of minutes if you just got a few more bullet points. So I'll, yeah, I'll yeah. Okay, so this is the um, the BCP uh, conditions again, and it relates to uh, covering the full cost of qualified weatherization measures, which was something that was reiterated in the uh, biennial conservation plan conditions. And so there's just a few um, few little wordsmith changes to the tariff that I think we would want to make to make sure that that is clear. And so one is just clarifying that the combined WIP EWIP program rebate covers the full cost of qualified weatherization measures, um, but exclusive of any funds leveraged from other funding sources, because that was something that was in the conditions, uh, was that uh, the, the agency, they are allowed to leverage, uh, the entire cost of the program doesn't have to come from us, that what they need from us as long as it qualifies for the program, we are obligated to provide the full associated cost of the weatherization work that they are submitting to us for reimbursement. But if they're leveraging additional sources, uh, that of course that amount is backed out of what we provide to the agency. So we're just going to put some language in there uh, to make it clear that we are going to cover the uh, full, you know, total install cost of the measure, but exclusive of any funds leveraged from other funding sources. And so we're we're going to continue to work on that language, but uh, that that was one change uh, that we're going to be making or sharing with you. And then uh, adding when cost effective using uh, utility specified avoided costs as another circumstance where a weatherization measure would qualify as cost effective. And that was part of the BCP condition is it would be cost effective under the Department of Commerce guidelines, but or uh, when cost effective using utility specific avoided costs. And I, I think honestly, under most circumstances, uh, the governing cost effectiveness is going to be um, the, the Department of Commerce specifications and the energy audit that's performed by the agencies uh, because the, it, it's custom, it's focused on uh, that singular project, that singular home, and it also is governed under the, the exemptions or the, the prioritization uh, that's outlined by Commerce. But um, I never have a problem with adding additional flexibility or you know different ways to look at it. So. I, I have no problem with that, uh, adding in when cost effective using utility specific avoided costs since that was requested of us. Uh, but probably, um, like I said, probably more often than not, though, uh, the cost effectiveness is going to be driven by uh, the, the commerce specification because I think there's a little more uh, flexibility. Are, are any uh, feedback or comments on those last two bullets? Uh, before I jump into the last one. Yeah, hey Alan, this is Sean. So the first bullet, I think, you know, the a clear way to state that would be additional funds are not precluded from being provided uh, to cover the project costs. It, it sounded, a, you know, I probably did want to do a little wordsmithing there just so it's clear what the intent is for for that specific adjustment to the tariff. Yeah, we're, we're going to work on that one a little bit and I'll make sure that you and Keith get a chance to see it too. Great, thank you. Yeah, that second point sounds good to me. All right. Uh, any other comments on those two bullets before I move on to the last one? Okay. Um, yeah, just a, another last one since we want to cover and the uh, BCP uh, conditions mandate that we cover the total installed cost of a measure. Uh, there's uh, some language that talks about incidental uh, repair or incidental work in health and safety. And I thought maybe incidental doesn't quite capture total installed cost associated. 
And so uh, the proposed wording, or uh, the, just the way it was phrased before. Oh yeah, we'd remove the word incidental. So I kept the word incidental and in saying I was going to remove it, but ignore that. Installed cost shall include associated repair work and health and safety improvements necessary instead of incidental repair work. That should have been uh, lined out. There we go. And so that was the last change that I saw with the tariff that we would need to make to make um to comply with the uh, requirements of the BCP. Cool. Uh, Alan, this is Sean. I'm just chiming in one last time here. That, I think that sounds good. I know we have some additional uh, continued conversation around incidental and you know the the project uh, that we discussed in the last meeting is still um, still being uh, you know still in play. So. I will commit to following up on that uh, when we have more details, but you know, that sounds like um, a, a third point is a change that we can be supportive of. Thank you. And uh, I, with that, I'm, I got to jump off. So, um, apologize everyone for ducking out early. Uh, thank you for your time and talk to you all later on. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Yep. Okay, so that's everything on my side. We will be. Uh, now following up with our low income agencies on the uh, the um, MOU uh, to make sure that they all uh, have that and are uh, able to uh, review that language and sign off. And um, also we'll be following up with our agencies to get a Q1 meeting on the calendar with them uh, to walk through uh, changes and get some additional uh, feedback from them. In the meantime, I'll be sending out uh, dividing out the um, changes that we're proposing, and I'll get those to uh, Sean and Keith, and we'll of course follow up with the uh, broader advisory group as well uh, to make sure that you're in the loop on the items that we uh, propose changing immediately uh, to meet compliance with the biennial conservation plan conditions, and then uh, areas that are also uh, fairly uh, a fairly high priority. Uh, but the timing is a little bit different, but those are both things that we're going to cover. We'll make sure we get that out to you to uh, look at the timing we anticipate for that. And uh, that is everything uh, from my side of the shop. Uh, any other questions, comments, concerns uh, before we move on to the biennial conservation plan discussion? Alan, there was one um, topic that came up in quarter three where we suggested the the possibility of having a subgroup of the advisory group um, that was focused on low income specific topics. Um, I don't know if we decided to move forward with that or not, but that's still on on the radar. Um, so we, uh, of course, per, per your discretion, but I think we talked about maybe sending out a, a, a request to CAG members to see who might be interested in that subgroup um, for specific topics like that, that asbestos project and stuff that we talked about that maybe didn't need to come to the whole group as um, in a quarterly meeting type of uh, focus. So I, I don't know that we need to discuss that right now, but I did want to just kind of put it back out there that that's still on my radar um, and it is something that we talked about doing in the new year. Well, I, I guess the question would be um, if there were any concerns about having the breakout group and uh, uh, silence being a consensus that we're OK to move forward with having a breakout. Um, I guess I would just ask that anybody that's interested, uh, please let us know and uh, we'd be glad to reach out to you um, to visit on uh, weatherization specific topics, uh, you know, as a, a supplement to our advisory group discussions. Okay, so uh, Desiree, let's put that as an action item. Any advisory group members or people on the phone who are interested in a subgroup um, focused on um, the low income program um, to let us know, maybe uh, send an email to, to Monica and, and Alan both, um, and then we'll follow up and see about setting up a, a supplemental group from that point. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Desiree. Yep, and I saw that uh, Sheila had um, might have had a few additional thoughts if you wanted to uh, share those. If not, that's fine. Um, no, um, Department of Commerce weatherization specifications, um, they use the term weatherization related repair commonly for 
the types of actions that could be captured by the word incidental. So you could replace the word incidental with weatherization related repairs. That ties it very closely to commerce and I'm very comfortable with anything that aligns us with the commerce specifications. So that, that may be the way to strengthen um, the language in that section now. It's just an idea. Yeah, and I, I like the idea of tying it to commerce. So we, we'll float that out with um, uh, Sean and Keith as well. And um, when we uh, send good. the uh, draft out, yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right, um, any other comments before we move on to the uh, biennial conservation plan? Okay, then I will pass it along. Thank you, Alan. Um, I actually think I'm gonna take this opportunity to offer a break up. Um, that didn't come out right. Offer up the time to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's let's reconvene at 10:35. Um, get a little a little um, drink or restroom break, whatever you need, and uh, we'll come back at 10:35. Uh, that gives you about nine minutes. Thanks, Monica. All right. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you soon. Hello. Welcome back to our meeting. I believe um, Desiree has restarted our recording as well. Can I get a confirmation from someone that they can hear me? I can hear you. Thank yep. you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So I think we're going to dive into our biennial conservation plan. Um, and just kind of an update on timing. Uh, Heather, please keep me honest on this if I if I misstate. We filed it with the commission on um, October 1st, I believe. The conditions documents have been in discussion. Um, we finalized the conditions document the week of, uh, well, I guess that was just last week, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and then I believe the commission is going to be reviewing it as part of the recessed open meeting on Tuesday the 18th. Um, is that correct, Heather? That's right. Okay. <laughs> I think you guys have been living and breathing it um, the last month or so. So uh, as, as part, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's just a quick question. Um, are those conditions finalized? Did I miss them? UTC stuff. So conditions and memos, I think, are typically posted two days before a scheduled meeting, um, maybe earlier than that. But the latest I would expect them to be public is the 16th. OK. This is Corey. Would it be possible to get a copy of the finalized conditions earlier than that, that doesn't really leave any stakeholders much time to review and develop comments on them, if there are any remaining. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah, if they're finalized, I'd love to see. That might be possible. Um, I can follow up with the two of you. Heather, I'd also, if we have a, like a, a final version, I know I have lots of drafts, but if we have an actual final version, um, I'd be happy to share it out with the advisory group too. Um, of course, uh, I defer to you on that, but um, I, I'd be happy to send out a, a mass email if, if that's appropriate. OK, why don't I check that the one that I sent on Friday um, is final? And then if you could take a look to make sure there aren't any surprises there, because I wasn't involved in the development of the conditions as intimately. Um, so I think that everything there is things I'm aware of, but once it, I know it's final, and once you know it's final, maybe you could send a email to the whole group. Okay, I can do that. Um, I did pull these conditions that I, I felt would be um, applicable directly to our advisory group uh, from that iteration. Um, so uh, let, let's just say that this, what's in the um, agenda here is based off of one of the drafts. I, I think it's the final draft. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to, to have this conversation with the advisory group so you have an idea of the types of things that um, the conditions are, are going to to require of the company and then, of course, of, of the advisory group because there's uh, specific areas where we have to uh, con consult with our advisory group before we can move forward. Um, different things that we haven't really done in the past. So some of it's the same. It's just kind of in, set in stone now, but, but there are some new conditions. So, But I, I'd be happy to, Heather, yeah. So uh, Desiree, that, that is a to-do for, for both Heather and I, is for Heather to confirm the final version, um, and then for Monica to, to read through it, make sure it aligns with, with um, 
our understanding and then for Monica to follow up and send it to the uh, advisory group as a whole. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, any other questions on that, Amy, um, before I move forward? Okay, or, or Corey, I apologize, Corey, anything further from you? Nope, uh, that, that should do it. Um, uh, you, you know, I think we've uh, worked through the conditions pretty significantly at this point. So I don't anticipate any surprises, but um, obviously uh, more time to review is helpful. Yep, it's a, it's a pretty meaty document. Um, so it, it's definitely, I've, I've read through it multiple times, um, but uh, it, it takes some time to really, you know, think about what the, the impact is based on the program implementation. So, um, what I have pulled, well, let, let me just step back and say, um, so Cascade's planning on, on being on the, the open meeting discussion Thursday, just really briefly, as they advise that it's going to be in recessed open meeting the following day, Tuesday, or following week, Tuesday, the 18th, and then I will be on the call, as will um, many of my, my peers from Cascade, uh, in case there are questions, comments, et cetera. Um, and I believe some of our uh, resource planning team will also be there if there's any questions from the IRP side of the shop. Um, so we, we plan on having good representation for that. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to move on to this next portion, which is some of the actual conditions that are in the document. And I didn't pull... I didn't pull all of them. Like I said, it's pretty needy. But what I pulled was there was a section that spoke specifically to our advisory group. Um, so I wanted to touch base on some of these. And then I had a couple additional bullets um, where there were there are other areas that we were going to be um, moving into that we really haven't done much of in the past. So um, just wanted to get your, your thoughts and, and kind of fly it by the, the advisory group to start with. Um, so, of course, um, Cascade must use our advisory group. Um, and this was created actually back in 2007, I think, um, through 2007, 2008, uh, the advisory group itself. Um, so we must use it to advise our, um, the company on conservation issues, including but not limited to, obviously, the conservation program and the measures that we offer, um, updates to Cascade's evaluation, measurement, and verification framework, uh, modification of existing or development of new evaluation, measurement, and verification methods, um, independent third-party evaluation of portfolio level um, BCP achievements. Again, that uh, falls back on the EMNV aspect. Um, development of conservation potential assessment, methodology, inputs, and calculations for cost effectiveness, uh, data sources and values used to develop and update supply curves. So um, I'm actually going to stop right there and just say on the EMND front, we have been doing some internal and we have kept our advisory group informed of the internal part. We haven't done a lot of external EMND. Um, we did uh, two conservation potential assessments ago. So, so prior to using uh, Lowe's Map when we used Teapot, we did actually do a, a portion of that evaluation, um, include an EMND aspect, but that's the last time we had a thorough third party EMND. So, um, Cascade is, is ready and willing to do this, but this is something that we're going to need to um, explore further on, on the best way to do it. You know, there has to be a con continuous EMD throughout the year, which is looking at different elements of the program. Not everything needs to be looked at every year, but um, there needs to be a, 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 a constant process where Cascade is working with a third party on EMD. And then at the, the completion of the biennium, um, the whole program essentially needs to be evaluated. Um, through an EMD format with a third party. And so that's where we're going to be relying on our, our advisory group for both the um, feedback on the RFP, the re um, request for a proposal when we um, seek uh, the evaluator that we're going to be using, but in addition to that, the actual um, process as we're going through the, that EMD will be um, coordinating with our advisory group on that. So that, that is something new that we have not done a lot of in the past. Um, the development of conservation potential assessment, we've we've done that. We've done a couple, um, and now we have to do it every two years. So that will be um, a continuous cycle that we'll be going through with our advisory group as well. Um, methodology inputs and calculations for cost effectiveness, no, there's nothing new in that. We come to the advisory group um, consistent, consistently, almost quarterly, um, to, to do that, and we will continue to do that as well, of course. So. Um, no, nothing new there. It's just um, kind of set as one of the expectations. Data sources and values used to develop and update supply curves. Um, yeah, same, same thing. That's part of the conservation potential assessment. It's part of um, 
you know, our IRP, it, that, that, that isn't changing. Um, the need for tariff modifications or mid binding program corrections. Um, we come to the advisory group for tariff changes um, whenever we need them. Obviously, you're, you're notified when an actual tariff is changed. We're notified the CAG a month ahead of time, and then we file with the commission. The process will change slightly as far as the actual program offerings because that is now in the biennial conservation plan. We're going to talk shortly here about the tariff changes um, that we need to put into effect to correlate with that plan. Um, but the, there's there's not an additional request here. This is really um, very standard process of what we've been doing. The, the change is um, when we have something in the biennial conservation plan, that exhibit one that we shared with you guys um, a couple quarters ago now, um, that that's where we're going to need some help in, in um, making sure that we, whatever program changes that we make, they're appropriately um, discussed and then um, uh, supplied to the to the commission as far as those changes have been um, in coordination with the advisor group. So we'll work on what that process looks like. Um, appropriate level of planning, um, level of and planning for marketing um, conservation programs. We ad advise you about our marketing as well. Incentives, yep, same thing, impact market and process evaluations. Um, programs for low-income residential customers, that's what we're doing, and we're even talking about having a subgroup as well, so um, I think that we've been doing that as well. Establishment of the biennial conservation target and program achievement results compared to the target, nothing new. We have our quarterly updates, we'll continue to do that, um, and obviously the biennial conservation target is, is part of, you know, the, the biennial conser or the um, conservation potential assessment actually set targets. Um, so we'll, we'll have those conversations and there's a, there's a specific timeline now that is incorporated in the conditions that, um, we'll be sharing with our advisory group as well. when we're looking at, you know, our, the cadence of what we're, we're, we're needing from assistance, um, conservation program budgets and actual expenditures compared to budgets. Uh, yeah, we'll, I mean, we do that now. We'll, we'll continue. Um, the budgeting is typically within the, um, uh, conservation plan itself. I don't think we've gotten given updates to those budgets in the past um, mid-cycle, so we'll have to figure out the best way to um, to disseminate that to the advisory group. And the development and implementation of new and pilot programs. Uh, we haven't done a lot of pilots, um, and so we actually have allocated costs or, or budget specific to commercial pilots and residential pilots, so that's something we're going to be depending on our advisory group <clears throat> Excuse me, is to work through what those pilots look like, what the targets for pilots look like, um, how we allocate cost effectiveness of those pilots. There's there's a whole criteria um, within the conditions document focused around pilots specifically. So it gives us um, a little bit of flexibility to try new things, which is really important. Um, so we'll we'll need to kind of flesh out how that how that looks um, through through our conservation program um, planning. And then um, advisory group meetings. Cascade must meet with its conservation advisory group at least four times per year, which we do, nothing new. Conservation advisory group members may request additional meetings. Cascade must provide reasonable advance notice of all conservation advisory group meetings. Um, so we, we do provide advance notice. Um, what's going to be a little different here, and I'll talk about this in a minute, is um, seeking out additional public uh, engagement in our, in our conservation advisory groups. So... Um, we we are posting the meeting notes and the videos after the fact. We're, we're going to um, be more proactive and make sure that we're um, posting notifications of upcoming meetings on our website as well and um, trying to seek out more more public in, in interaction opportunities um, so that we can have just, just a, a more robust um, advisory group as a whole um, and, and make sure we're very transparent in our efforts, of course. So um, advanced notification of filings, except for the conservation cost recovery adjustment filing, um, Cascade must provide its conservation advisory group an electronic copy of any all, of all conservation filings that Cascade intends to submit at least 30 days in advance, which is what we're doing right now anyway. Um, and then, of course, the cover letter must note um, how far in advance we advised um, the, the group. Advanced notification of meetings. So Cascade must notify its conservation advisory group of company and commission public meetings scheduled to address its conservation program, its tariffs, or the development of conservation potential assessment. Um, so this is where we're going to be working with our uh, customer communications folks on the website to make sure that it's very clear that we're uh, advising when these, these are coming. There's, there's, I'm sure there's some additional opportunities. I'm not sure. I, I don't know if that's going to be through 
um, bill inserts or how else we're going to go about um, I- increasing notification to our pub- our our customers. Um, but certainly it's, it's on our radar. And, and one thing I'm actually asking Jocelyn to work with me this year is to um, better ways to improve our conservation advisory group meetings. Um, so I actually did talk to a few of you this last year, kind of did an interview on what the process looked like, how best we could coordinate, uh, make sure everybody's getting the, the best use of their time. Um, so I, I think there's some some really good opportunity for us to improve this process as well as making it more more. Um, both interactive, inclusive of the public, um, and transparent in Cascade's efforts. And I think the more um, feedback we can get on on how to improve that, the better better process it is for everybody. So it's definitely on my my goal list for the year. Um, Cascade must notify advisory group members of all public meetings scheduled to address Cascade's IRP. Um, Cascade must also coordinate a meeting with its advisory group and the entity conducting the CPA. Addressing the scope and design of the CPA, this meeting must be held early enough in the IRP process to incorporate the group's advice. Cascade must notify um, advisory group members of IRP advisory group meetings that present the company's gas price forecast and resource cost assumptions used in the development of the company's IRP. So um, Cascade EE group uh, works really closely with our resource planning team, um, who is as, as most of you would know, um, in charge of the integrated resources plan process. Um, we will continue to do that. Um, Brian, Devin, Ashton, Mark Sellers, Vaughn, um, we, we really do, you know, partner hand in hand and look at what, what the deliverables are, but we'll make sure that the um, communication is not just, I, I know they have a communication um, process that they have as well for their technical advisory groups. So we'll make sure that they're paired um, in our advisory group. While many of the same members um, attend both meetings, We'll make sure that notifications are sent um, across the board so that um, we, we meet this obligation, um, both in spirit and in reality. So, um, Cascade must consult with the advisory group starting no later than July 1, 2023, to begin to identify achievable conservation potential for 24 and, um, 2024 through 2033, and to begin to set annual and biennial targets for the 2024-2025 biennium. Um, so while it seems a long way away, it's, it's really not. <laughs> I'm already looking ahead at what the deliverable dates are and everything for um, our requirements. So it's, it's um, pretty close to when we would typically start meeting with our advisory group on um, the CPA results uh, and, and doing this biennial conservation plan that we just did. It's about it's about two weeks before we would typically do that. So it's, it's not too much earlier. Um, so we'll just have to plan now to make sure that we get the cadence right and give everybody an um, apt opportunity to participate. Um, Cascade must also inform the advisory group members when its projected expenditures indicate the, cus- the cap that Cascade will spend more than 120% or less than 80% of its annual conservation budget. Um, this is a little different. We haven't um, informed m- mid-cycle like this. It's It's been end of year for the budget itself. So uh, we'll, we'll have to revise our processes and make sure that we um, keep a keen eye on eye on this so that we can um, notify as part probably of the the quarterly update. I would assume that we'll uh, um, include it, maybe not um, in the first quarter because we have to make sure the process is in place. But certainly we will um, start doing that once the uh, conservation plan conditions are approved. Um, and then prior to filing the BCP, Cascade must provide the following information to the advisory group. Um, Again, this is just looking at the exact timeline on when we'll be doing the um, draft 10-year conservation potential, the two-year targets, um, draft program details, including budgets, et cetera. So we've provided this to you in the past, um, but it's been a little bit later than what this timeline is. So we'll need to um, push it up a little bit um, so that you have an opportunity to weigh in mid-draft of the biennial conservation plan versus once the draft itself has been completed. I also put on here a couple additional items. Um, as I mentioned, EM and B is going to be quite different. Um, we, we likely are going to need to have a single staff member just focusing purely on EM and B. Um, not saying they won't have other duties, but um, I want one person whose responsibility is going to be to, to really focus on what the EM and B is going to, to look like for our programs. Um, it is third party, but then we need to work with that third party to, to make sure they have the data that they need access to, um, figure out which measures each year or each cycle we're going to be looking at so that we look at the entire program um, within the biennium. So um, that or within the four years, I have to look at that again, but 
anyway, um, that's going to be a, a focus for a single um, staff member. And then pilots, I discussed that as well. Um, we're going to be expanding out what the pilots look like and discussing with our, our advisor group. And I think probably in quarter two is when we'll kind of break out what, what pilots we're looking at this year and what opportunities we see. And then, um, as I mentioned, how to file revisions in the plan. Um, that's one of the questions that we have for advisory group as well is um, we have our plan, we have our exhibit one, we have a tracking document um, as part of exhibit one. If we have changes to the, the, the program, um, what is the best way for our advisory group to help us um, in doing that? And I think in Heather, you're going to have to to help me with this a little bit too, from the commission's perspective. I don't believe that changes to the conservation plan are a standard filing. Um, I, I'd have to know exactly how PSE does it as well, but um, that's something that we'll have to really kind of walk through is if there is a change that we need to make to the program, let's say um, per our exhibit one, um, our new rebate for, um, I'm kind of blanking on it. I think our furnace rebate is going to go up. So in this year, it's going to go up, say next year, for some reason, we have to reduce it. We have to make a change to that biannual conservation plan exhibit one. Is that an addendum we then file um, or is it not really a filing? What, what does that actually look like? I want to make sure that we meet our obligation, but I don't think it's entirely clear what that process really looks like for making a change once it's from the biennial conservation plan. So um, I'll be working with, with Heather and then um, obviously with this advisory group to make sure that um, we know what that process really looks like. One of the ideas was that it would remove um, some of the, the time constraints that we have with our current process where if we have a measure that changes, you know, it was in our old tariff, um, we would advise the advisory group, we'd draft the new tariff, it, that you'd have it for a month, we'd file it with the commission, the commission would have it for essentially a month. So, I mean, from the time when we thought we needed to make a change to when the actual change could occur, it's a good two months later. Um, and, and this new process is supposed to help alleviate that lag time, obviously still giving our advisor group time to weigh in, but um, not require a full two month uh, lag time to make an, a program change, what could be a time sensitive program change. So um, that's the goal anyway. Um, to that point, um, that's just what I was talking about here with exhibit one items removed from the main body of the report. Um, we're uh, correlating with the electric utility process for their tariff changes. Um, that kind of segues into my um, tariff update question that I have for the CAG. But before I jump into that, I, I know that's a lot to, to digest, and I just kind of ran through the whole thing. So I, I'd like to give um, advisory group members an option or opportunity at least to weigh on some of these conditions that we've um, we've seen that are likely going to come out of the final conditions document. Thank you for the note, Heather. So one thing I do want to note is it's it's really clear that everybody is busy right now. <laughs> um, and, and these additional requirements um, are going to ask for, um, you know, time for people to review and really um, consider on, on not just Cascade's behalf, but just on energy efficiency programs within Washington as a whole. Um, I want to be respectful of people's time, so we'll try to, to minimize requests. But I, I do have to say there's some very specific um, things that we, we have to ask the advisory group, we have to keep in mind for the advisory group. So we're, we're going to keep our, our cadence, you know, quarterly cadence. Um, if there's additional requests, I know last year we had an additional, let's say, ad hoc um, conservation potential assessment meeting that we had in March with a couple of, um, of our stakeholders. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to minimize additional requests. Um, if there's something specifically that you need from Cascade or or is not clear, you know, please reach out. I want to make sure the communication network is open so that you can do that. Um, but there's some very definite requirements that we have to meet, um, and we're we're ready and willing, um, but we're really going to need help from the advisory group. Um, so, but no, no, nothing new there necessarily, but I did want to kind of point that out. Um, I, I'm fully aware that everybody is taxed um, on their on their time commitments. Um, I, I'll respect that, um, not to say that I'm not going to ask for a little bit of time here to, to help us meet these requirements as well. So were there any questions on the um, conditions document or just kind of wait and get a chance to fully review it when we've got that draft or that uh, final document for you? Okay. I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to my next topic here. It's uh, the actual tariff update. So 
as I mentioned, our current tariff um, lists out the the measures themselves, and it's the the, the measure rebates and everything. The the actual um, individual furnaces or whatnot, you know, that we offer, and then the dollar amount per per measure. Um, we need to change those tariffs to align with the biennial conservation plan. Um, we have not yet changed them because we were waiting for the commission to to um, both look at the plan, and we wanted to make sure um, not to to give the advisory group a big set of tariffs to look at um, right over the Christmas holidays. <laughs> that actually, I, I apologize. That really was my initial plan was to give them to you over Christmas, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not the best thing. Um, so the the intention is um, hopefully to get them to you next week. Um, the we're going to be updating um, the request, and this was from, uh, I think Andrew had initiated it last year, was to update Cascade's tariffs to align with um, Puget Sound Energy's format. And so right now, Cascade has a separate um, tariff uh, sheet, excuse me, for the low-income program. We have a separate tariff sheet. There's actually a couple. If there's like two pages, it's a separate sheet itself. But um, we have we have a low income version, we have a com commercial industrial, and then we have a residential version. So uh, based on feedback from, from Andrew last year, the request was for Cascade to transition to something more similar to what PSE uses, which is a single tariff sheet that encompasses essentially all of the programs, maybe, maybe not the low income specifically, but um, it encompasses all the programs. Um, and then points back to the biennial conservation plan with the actual measures and dollar amounts listed within that plan. And so Cascade's um, approach in the biennial conservation plan that we did was the exhibit one, which does contain all of the actual measures themselves. And then um, now the next step is to update those tariffs, uh, tariff sheets and, and have them um, align sort of with what PSE is doing um, so that it doesn't actually include the specific dollar amounts and everything, but more of the, the program parameters, um, uh, including, you know, what, who is it available for and um, what, what's the cost recovery, you know, the, 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 the standard um, categories. So I started to dig into that process um, earlier this week, and then I realized in looking at um, Puget Sound Energies, they actually still do have placeholders for their commercial program, and they also have a placeholder for the residential um, conservation. So a question, and Heather, I think this one might be geared towards you, but it could be the advisory group as a whole. I'm going to uh, share real quick um, this one there. So this is Puget Sound Energies. Um, Actually, let me get to the other one here. This is their shared um, tariff sheet that I'm modeling Cascades after. Um, it's like they've got their purpose, they've got their availability, source of funding, you know, all of that. That's that simple Cascade can can um, copy that format. Where I was a little bit confused, I thought that um, everything for PSC's uh, EE programs were encompassed in this one this one sheet. Um, when I looked at the tariff sheets that PSC has, it looks like they still have like a, a 206, which is referring to their residential program um, for EE. This tariff sheet is just referencing the path, the other one I was talking about, the all-encompassing one. But they have one for residential. They also, here's another one, they have one for commercial industrial. And really, it's not listing out anything new. It's just cross-referencing their schedule 183, which is this all-encompassing one again. Um, my question to you, Heather, or to the advisory group as a whole is, um, my intention for Cascade was to take all of our commercial industrial and and put them onto a similar sheet as the 183, and then um, not to have a separate commercial, not to have a separate residential. Um, the ones that PSC seems to have here just really look like placeholders. Um, and I'm not sure from a customer perspective that that they need a placeholder they just need the, the one where they can go and get all their information um, is there I, I guess maybe I haven't voiced my, my question is there a reason that Cascade should maintain our commercial industrial and residential in the same format that PSE has or can we only do the single document the single tariff sheet that includes both commercial and residential 
and then have it cross-reference our conservation plan, which was the original intention. I did not realize that cap that PSE still had a, essentially a placeholder for the residential and commercial. Um, and the request from Andrew was that we make it similar to what PSE is doing um, with the assumption that they have the single um, schedule 183, which is this one. Um, so I guess that's my, my request to you, Heather, maybe weigh in and let me know your thoughts. Um, I am probably not able to answer, you know, in reference to do what PSC does and then PSC is not actually doing what you thought they were doing. Um, I think if I'm understanding this correctly, the um, one of the driving goals here is to not have to update tariffs so frequently. Okay. Um, only very recently, Pacific Power, the way they're getting around this, um, and this hasn't been approved yet by the commission, uh, but um, I'm going to put some words in the chat here that they sent to their conservation advisory group. Um, instead of having a list of schedules, they changed the list of schedules to things listed on the Washington Energy Efficiency Program section of the company website, which I think we're I think we're okay with. Again, we're still sort of mulling over this, and this has to be approved by the commission. But staff side is like, huh. Um, uh, we're supportive of not having to change tariffs as often. Um, so that's just one idea. And again, I I don't know if I can weigh in specifically on the PSC thing, but I'm happy to follow up with you. Okay, I I appreciate it. I I could do with. PSC has, because um, that would be us revising our, our commercial tariff, our residential tariff, and then filing tariff sheets, I'm sorry, and then filing a, a new combined tariff sheet that really does have the all encompassing, you know, again, with the expectation that we're not really having to update these very often. In that case, the residential and the commercial are simply placeholders. There's, there's like no definitive content <laughs> there's not a lot there that's that's going to be helpful to the customer or the company really it's just a placeholder um, we can do that if that's what we need to do um, my preference would be this just a single document um, similar to PSE's um, 183 and that's the one that we reference um, I know that they are referencing to, to your point Heather they are referencing um, if you look here number between 200 and 299 those are the other tariff um, sheets that I was just pulling that, that they're cross-referencing. So, um, yeah, I I would love to get this to the advisory group next week um, in draft so that we can get it filed and, you know, move forward. We, we don't, our program aren't going to change until this gets into place because our existing tariff dictates um, our, our current rebate offerings. So with the biennial conservation plan, I'd love to get that in place as soon as possible. We can't do that until we do this initial tariff change. And then then we're out of the cycle, essentially. <laughs> um, so if, maybe if you could follow up on that for me, Heather, I would really appreciate it. And then I'm not sure um, before I keep, you know, going on and on. Is there anyone else that has feedback on the tariff specifically from our advisory group here? OK, I'm not I'm not hearing any concerns or questions. Um, so. Maybe we'll just take that. Um, yes, thank you, Heather, as a as a to do for Heather to follow up on the um, format of the tariff changes, um, and then after that, I'll make sure that I get um, I'll take that into consideration, and then we'll do the revisions and get a copy of the tariff sheets to our advisory group. Again, we just mentioned it 30 days before we actually do the filing with the commission. So much appreciated. Thank you, Heather, for that. So I'm going to go back to the agenda. All right. So um, we have our annual report that we're starting to work on. Um, many of you are familiar with our annual report. Um, most of you actually should be familiar with our annual report format. As far as timing goes, um, if the conditions document for the biennial conservation plan is approved, which I assume it's going to be approved, um, hopefully after next week, then that dictates that our annual report, um, which would typically be due to the commission by January or excuse me June 1st, I think it moved it to June 15th. Um, Heather, you can clarify for me if I'm if I'm um, not 
recalling that correctly, but I do believe that that's pushed to June 15th, which um, is not a big difference for us. We'll probably, yeah, I don't remember. I have to go back and look at it. Um, we'll probably just kind of keep the same cadence we have in the past. We start um, with looking at our, our um, we, we start with an accounting reconciliation of our residential program, commercial program, low-income program. Um, we look at all the rebates. We cross-reference it, make sure that, you know, all the customers got the rebates we expected them to. Um, and then we go in and we look at the cost effectiveness of the programs. We make sure that they are plugged into the um, spreadsheets. As part of that discussion, um, um, as part of that, that process, excuse me, is, is we plug them into those spreadsheets that we shared with the um, advisory group in the past underneath the annual reports. Um, I can click on the link right now and show you what I'm talking about. But be before I do that, I don't want to just start steering around and, and kind of just speaking on about the annual report as a whole. What I, what I kind of wanted to bring your attention to more than anything is, you know, we have our process in place. With those spreadsheets, they've changed a little this year. Uh, based on the um, non-energy impact discussions that we had with uh, our, our conservation potential assessment vendor. Um, those um, changes have, have we, we put in place because, for one thing, um, Cascade is now incorporating the social cost of carbon into the avoided costs. So some of the ways that we were um, accounting for some of the non-energy impacts um, on a societal level, um, we have removed from that spreadsheet because it is incorporated on the back end into the avoided costs themselves. Uh, so that's one change that you'll see this year. Uh, in addition, we looked at our participant um, non-energy impacts column on, on how we calculated it per measure type. Um, and that has been updated as well, um, you know, really confirming which ones are applicable for, for water, sewer, um, non-energy energy impacts. It's not just any water measure. It's, it's, it's the use of those water, you know, how much water is actually um, used as part of that measure as well. So we've, we've looked at different elements of this as part of these conversations for the non-energy impacts. I believe, um, uh, and, and again, um, Commission, please, please clarify for me if I'm incorrect, that um, we'd like to have a few more conversations with the advisory group as a whole about what uh, the way that Cascade is is accounting for these non-energy impacts. Um, we updated our social cost of carbon. We're good. You know, the avoided costs, we understand the process there. Um, we updated the, the there's like a 10% at the portfolio level that we include um, for non-energy impacts. And then we have those measure level specific non-energy impacts that are calculated into each of the measures that, that the um, company accounts for in our, in our spreadsheets. So um, we did have a conversation last March as part of the conservation potential assessment. And then we had another conversation with AEG, again, our vendor for the conservation potential assessment um, in August, September, really nailing down what we thought those should be. Because as we developed our portfolio of measure offerings, you know, we had to include um, these non-energy impacts into the calculations for establishing what we, you know, deemed cost effective to be able to offer through the program. Um, per those conversations, of course, then as we're looking at our annual report, how are we updating those, um, that, that spreadsheet to align with it? Or are some of those updates more appropriate when we look at the program moving forward versus backward facing? Um, so those are some of the conversations that we just wanted to tee up with the advisory group. Um, I think, Quarter two is when we'll have a little more in-depth conversation. My understanding is the commission as a whole is, is really wanting to dig into non-energy impacts a little bit. Um, I think the regional technical forum is looking at it as well. Uh, Carrie, please please weigh in on that one. I believe that they they contacted us a couple times on um, interest about what the, the region is doing for non-energy impacts. Yeah, that's... Um that's correct, Monica. They're uh, wanting to build off of the Power Council's list of um, non-energy impacts and understand, you know, what is most relevant to our program. And I believe we have a meeting with Annika and Jennifer uh, in about a week to discuss it. But I think, in general, I mean, the, the one of the questions from um, the region is is cost effectiveness um, and how we're going to calculate cost effectiveness um, for the program. So 
part of the conditions document. I, I'm not sure if this is really for the annual report specifically, so I might be kind of segueing here. Um, but one of the questions in the conditions document was how will each of the utilities um, count the cost effectiveness of their programs? Well, Cascade currently uses the utility cost test as our primary um, cost test. We also report the, the total resource cost test. Um, the conditions documents kind of went back and forth a little bit on requiring the TRC, a uh, uh, modified TRC, or if it would allow the utility cost test. So at, at this point, moving forward, um, Cascade will continue with the utility cost test for this biennium. Um, having said that, any conversations, any workshops we have at the regional level, state level, um, relating to cost effectiveness of gas programs, Cascade will be you know, right there in the middle of it, having those conversations so that we understand if there's a, a, a regional cost test that makes a little bit more sense because of the way that we incorporate the social cost of carbon as well. Um, and of course, NEIs end up playing in the, into that conversation um, as you look at it, whether that's the TRC side or, you know, the, the, the different ways that we incorporate NEIs um, as a region and, and what, what do we really find as quantifiable. Um, and of course, we depend on our, our um, the experts at, at Applied Energy Group who developed our conservation potential assessment to help um, weigh in on, on those those aspects uh, from a regional and a national level because they have insight into to some um, efforts on the you know on the other side of the states as well. So I, I don't know that I've actually given you anything concrete. To, to act on or to, to weigh in on, but I, I wanted to tee up the NEI conversation to let you know that Cascade's spreadsheet has changed slightly um, for the annual report to correlate with the, the changes that we discussed with Applied Energy Group. Um, this is going to align with what's in the biennial conservation plan and what we, what we said we were going to move forward with. Um, I think there is going to be another conversation a little more in depth. We'll have um, you know more documentation to provide and everything as we as we look at this probably in quarter two of our advisory group. Um, any questions or comments in the in the meantime or recommendations on on things that we should include in that in that agenda relating to NEIs? I should say okay. I'm not really hearing any. Then um, Desiree, I'll jump that is a in. yeah. Please Great. Heather, go ahead. I wanted to see if anyone else wanted to speak first. Um, I think the only note I'd make, and this isn't quite like a recom recommendation is, um, you know, uh, Cascade is looking for um, direction as are all companies on what the, what is, what is the big, um, big umbrella under which cost effectiveness is going to fit for everybody. Um, and then that is sort of a separate question from um, questions related to your CPA with AEG and what happens in this biennium um, and which is even a separate question from movement on the regional level to try to think more through this stuff. And so I think, um, especially for stakeholders sake, you know, stakeholder fatigue here, it's important for us, the commission, but also for companies to figure out what are some questions that can be asked uh, in larger rooms, um, and then what are some questions that are more specific to our our company? Um, and again, I'm I'm naming our role in that because we have opened this docket on general cost effectiveness. I think a number of people here submitted comments on it. Thank you. Um, that's two one zero eight zero four docket two one zero eight zero four. Um, we, we're sort of on pause in that docket because we lost an analyst on staff. So we've kind of had to reshuffle um, what our priorities are, uh, but we're hoping that that docket will be the the forum for fielding some of these questions that apply to all companies, so that you know folks like Cascade and CAG can can be very specific about what we discuss. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Um, Desiree, please please make sure to note that docket number. Okay, it was two one zero eight zero four, and I I think Heather, that's a really good that's a really good point. You know what what is specific to the utility and then what is um, maybe better for a, a wider regional discussion when we're looking for direction from the commission. Okay. Um, so the other question, and I've kind of prefaced this a couple of times, um, is the NIA savings. Um, 
I believe that NIA typically gives us their, their final estimate of savings around um, probably the end of March, early April. Peter, please correct me if I'm wrong on the timeline. I, th I think it was mid-April last year. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I, I've checked with the team. Right now they're targeting like an early to mid-April. Um, okay. And if, you know, we need to make it earlier April, we can. Or <laughs> you know, whatever flexibility, I you know, we can work with the team. But um, that's, yeah, I think early April is about as early as um, they thought they could get them out. So. I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to... Cascade has not had appreciable savings from the NIA efforts to to report in the past. I think last year we had like 14,000. And when you look at the annual report, um, it just says, here's our savings. And oh, by the way, here's the savings that NIA attributed. So it didn't yep. calculate into our cost effectiveness. It also yep. didn't calculate into our total savings. Um, we have not included the NIA savings in our um, cost effectiveness calculations as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, we have actually provided, here's the program cost effectiveness, and oh, by the way, here's it if we do include NIA too. So we do have both calculations within right. our annual report. Um, so the, the question that, that arises now, because we haven't had appreciable savings in the past, and it looks like this year we might have what I would consider appreciable savings. Um, the estimate that I received in, in I think it was October, was like 150,000 therms or something okay. for the residential program. Um, with that in mind, how, at a regional level, um, how have other utilities accounted for these savings? And have they actually accounted them within their savings? Or I, I've heard that they have not, or I've heard people pushing back saying, hey, you can't, you can't count them because of X, Y, and Z. Or um, my understanding, and I'm going to go back years. <laughs> um, yeah. and I think, Corey, this was before you worked with our programs, actually. Um, Public Council had said, hey, we're okay with you not, I'm, I'm totally paraphrasing and I apologize for doing this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, we're okay with you not counting the NIA cost and your cost effectiveness until you have savings to attribute. Once you have savings to attribute, we would expect a percentage of the costs or whatever to be allocated to the programs. So um, I think we're to that stage now is, do we need to allocate a certain percentage of those costs to be able to claim those savings? Can we claim those savings? Maybe I should just be quiet and let Peter weigh in on his <laughs> what he's hearing from other utilities. That's kind of the question we're at. Got it. No, that that's great. Um, so maybe to your first question of how have other folks um, dealt with it, and from you know what I've seen in my understanding is, and it I, I think it's sort of changing a little bit too um, in terms of uh, you know how kind of evolving thinking on it, um, but. Energy Trust, I believe, does count them um, in their savings uh, accounting metrics. Um, so they count code savings. Um, and, and really, I, I guess I should say, since the natural gas portfolio at NIA is a little bit younger than the electric portfolio, which has been around for you know two and a half decades, um, while you know products are are getting to market and you know we're getting to market interventions here in the near term. Um, the savings have really been on codes and standards work. Um, so they've, Energy Trust has, I believe, has reported those. Um, the Washington utilities, I believe, have, uh, they haven't necessarily included them in their savings targets, but they've sort of, they've reported them. So it sounds like sort of what, what Cascade has kind of done in the past of, you know, they're not necessarily part of our main metric, but they're here in addition. Um, and I think the that that thinking is is sound, it seems like it's kind of evolving as sort of you know new folks transition into to new roles and folks say you know why aren't we counting these and one of the kind of things I think that's kind of been a question in the past has been um, because uh, Nia works at a regional scale um, and you know Nia doesn't doesn't claim savings right Nia does everything on behalf of the the funders um, you know if there's a certain uh, you know, pie of savings that's divided amongst the the funders by um, funding share, essentially. Um, so, but I, I've been in discussions with the team because this issue is brought up is, okay, well, we can't claim it for our territory, but, it, you know, because we've got this save this per percent of savings for the, the larger Northwest region, um, and we can't tie that back directly to our territory. So there's been some uh, different feelings about that, but 
in working with the team, they said, hey, look, you know, in the future, if if we're able to tie savings directly to a funder's territory, um, we will sort of do our best to, to sort of point to those those numbers and say, hey, here's here's, you know, for Cascade, for instance, you know, these code savings, we believe that, you know, the number is X. Um, but otherwise, it would be sort of reported as a funding share of the, the code savings for the region. Um, now, if they're state codes, that's, you know, that that obviously uh, geographically bounds bounds those a bit more than if they're just, you know, savings for, um, you know, for the Northwest region as a whole. So I know that's a really squishy answer to say uh, some count them, uh, others count them, I think, in the way that, that Cascade has done. Um, you know, I'd be happy to maybe take a conversation offline where we, if it's interesting to talk with, you know, energy trusts and sort of say, hey, you know, Monica and, and team, you know, let's sort of sit down and understand how they've been thinking about those. Um, another potential option is, you know, after those savings are reported out in early April, um, you know, we could maybe have a more a great, greater discussion on like, okay, these are the savings, you know, attributed to to Cascades funding and NIA on codes, for instance, um, and then really dig into, you know, what, what what you know? What's in that? How did how do we think about that um, with someone from the um, uh, you know the the planning and analysis team who you know worked and coordinated the analysis of uh, of those savings to to make it really real instead of kind of hypothetical, right? Um, of mm -hmm. what could be in savings numbers. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there because I'm not sure I've even said anything that's useful. <laughs> no, I I think you really have, Peter. Um, one of the the questions that came up for me is, you know, the, the savings are for 2021 specifically, right? Um, the big code change that occurred um, in Washington state was applicable starting essentially 2021 um, for residential homes. I mean, that was, a, that was a huge impact, um, at least per Cascades contention, it has a huge impact to our territory and, and certainly from our conversations that we've had with, um, you know, builders. Um, Actually, our business development um, manager was on the the call here, and I think he actually had to jump off. But um, he would certainly have some feedback on on what um, kind of impact that's had to to building high efficiency natural gas homes. Um, keeping that in mind, I mean, we're talking about most of the savings, uh, and please correct me if I'm incorrect in this, Peter. But most of the savings that I, I believe uh, Mia was estimating to attribute to um, the, the gas funders was based on code changes. And I believe yes, most yeah. of those were associated with the residential side of the shop. Um, in my mind, yeah, that I mean, correlates, yeah. right? Um, okay. So in, in my mind, that correlates yeah. directly to, um, you know, this, this change in, 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 in codes, right. which is one of the goals of market transformation. I mean, right. Cascade is, is, is helping to fund NIA um, because we're looking for market transformation. We're looking for these uh, efficiencies to be increased. And if the market transforms, then that's all that's available out there. And so you've already accomplished half of it. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we fund NIA. If, we're, if that's one of the reasons we're funding NIA and, oh, by the way, here's some success. Um, you know, the, the code has changed. Um, we should be able to account for some of those savings for 2021. Yeah. <laughs> I just, it, it, in my mind, it seems like that should be a given that those should be attributable yeah. based on that. Um, I completely understand your point of, of how do you designate it if it's, you know, specifically within Cascades territory. We know what's in our territory right. for rebates that we actually offer. But when you're talking about that, that, that code change, that market transformation, how do you narrow it down more than um, just saying Washington as a whole. So I, I understand there's a, a question there and, and historically it's been, you know, a percentage of, okay, well, we have this many funders based right. on your funding level. Here's the percentage of what the savings are. Um, I, I believe that's what you were saying. And again, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Um, um, yeah. 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 So I, I think that comes down to, um, you know, how, how then I've got my annual report coming up. I've got a couple months, but I kind of need a, 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 I need a conversation. I need a consensus. I need a regional direction on the way that I report it. Um, I would love to count it towards my residential program. And to that point, like I'd said, um, we, we didn't quite meet hundred percent of our goal. Um, we got really close um, at the portfolio level. We're okay. We, we met it with mm -hmm. combined with commercial. Um, 
this is residential savings that could be attributed to my residential program. If I could even account for, you know, um, 30% of it or something of the 150,000, yeah. then we've pretty much met our residential goal. So I don't know that it's appropriate for Cascade necessary to account for the whole 100% of whatever might be coming. But I do think, I, I think there needs to be a conversation about whether a percentage of it would be. And then, oh, by the way, a percentage of that cost of participating with EA needs to also be accounted into the cost effectiveness. Um, maybe I'm making it more convoluted than it needs to be, but I do think that's something that we need to actually explore. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think the the like the cost accounting is a tough one, as you know, right? Because there's almost an inverse relationship between funding of markets information efforts and the you know realization of savings, right? Um, because you know all the work that happened for these savings happened, you know, three years ago, right? To advocate for the code and you know weigh in and and you know technical advising and all that. Um, but yeah, I I I, I agree. I, I think it is. Um, I think it does make sense. And you know, I, I guess the other thing to say on the you know the the analysis of the savings is that. Um, you know, I'm sure Monica are actually probably more aware, we're well aware of the steps than I am. But um, you know, part of that analysis that the planning team, you know, they do their own analysis on estimated savings, but then they actually have a third party, you know, independent, you know, folks come in and and you know vet that and say, you know, was there, you know, a was there influence? Did you know Nia and the you know the the funders, Cascade being one of them, actually affect these savings, you know, or or would it have just happened otherwise? Um, so try and show some causality and then kind of impact um, and verify those savings. So it is, there is a really rigorous, you know, off the books of NIA uh, work that happens, which, um, you know, just to sort of, just not to give the imp impression that we're just over here making up numbers and uh, estimating things, that there is, it, it is very vigorous uh, uh, analysis. So yeah, I, I think it totally makes sense to be able to to, to count them. Um, what do you think makes the most sense, Monica, in terms of, uh, you know, my thought was maybe the next CAG, since we'll have those numbers, be able to come in and, and you know, talk about them with, with some of the planning folks. But would it make more sense to maybe, yeah, have a discussion with somebody at ETO who, you know, thinks about how they report these? Because that's a, I, I feel like they might be able to say, hey, here's our, here's our way that we think about it and structure that thinking um to have something to kind of yeah correlate i think that i think that would be helpful i I, okay. I think obviously in quarter two when we come back to the cag we can say oh, and by the way here's the final numbers yeah um I, what i would like to do is say here's the final numbers and this is bait and, and here's how energy trust deals with it or here's how some regional partners do it so maybe if we have a breakdown of um historically what cascade has done um where Nia gets the numbers um, and, and that that um, review process that you just mentioned. So we maybe have a, a breakout of, of what the third party EMD looks like for for this type of process. Um, and then and and here's our recommendation of how we're going to address it. Maybe it is just the same way we did it last year, um, but but maybe not. I mean, I I would really like us yeah. to kind of come back with a recommendation, and we can talk about it with the advisory group. I don't want to come to the advisory group in mid-April and say okay and, and here's what we're looking for because our <laughs> we I yeah. have to have my my draft have a lot of time after that, right? yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> I've got like two weeks so it's it's just not enough time <laughs> um but I'd, I'd like to have kind of a, a, a free conversation and and like you said that's a really good idea to meet with energy trust and say really how how are you incorporating these and and supporting it and everything and then kind of coming back with best practices that we see um, that that would be very helpful for me, Peter, yeah. if you could maybe set up one of those conversations. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure Absolutely. I've talked with some of the energy trust folks as well um, on the on the Oregon side. But if you know, if we could coordinate, um, if if you would maybe take that as a takeaway, Desiree, that's yeah. an action item. Yep. Um, yeah, happy to do to, that before to, the next. To set meeting. that up. Yeah, that would that would be great. Thank you. Um, yeah. And then I I would like to give other folks on the advisory group time to opportunity to weigh in. Um, I know I've said a lot of what my opinion is, and I don't know that that's necessarily the the regional opinion. Um, I, I know it's probably not. So obviously I'll stop talking and give someone else an opportunity. <laughs> well, this is this is Mike Parvenin. Um, I actually have kind of the reverse thought, Monica. I know we haven't talked about this in a while, but our, our target is based on our, our conservation potential assessment, um, the BPA going forward and 
I think these types of efforts are not built into that potential assessment. Um, and that, but it does impact it. So like these code changes that took impact, took, took, took went into place. They affected our, our uh, uh, achievable amount for the year. So for example, we didn't hit our target. That becomes a reason why not. So rather, uh, so rather than claiming the savings, which our programs did not necessarily produce, even though we're funding in Tania, it's our programs did not produce the savings, but that it our savings were impacted by the NIA efforts. So in other words, here's our target. We didn't achieve it, but part of that reasoning, we, we need to provide reasoning why not, right? So part of that reasoning is these code changes and the impact of NIA. Had those not gone into effect, you know, maybe you can do a trend analysis or something to be able to demonstrate that, that we would have achieved this potential. Or here's what that potential target would have looked like had we known this that this um, when those targets were established. Because we got to keep all this circular. Remember, we got the the biennial conservation plan which sets our targets, um, and we're working around uh, working around that. This is kind of an external effort that is not built into that process necessarily um so so in my mind i think uh, trying to claim the savings and the cost it creates a mismatch with the potential assessment um but it impacts it going forward so i don't know so i think there's still a way to account i think cascade's actually doing it right we identify the costs that we've done with nia we can identify those savings um that 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 are directly attributable for for us, uh, but there's also some of these other savings that aren't necessarily uh, uh, directly attributable, code changes and so forth. We can give those as reasons and maybe put a quantifiable number that that uh, how that relates to our target. If that makes that's, sense. Yeah, that's a really good point, Mike. Is um, sometimes the conservation potential assessments aren't able to account for um, some of these changes. I mean, if they have enough forewarning, they possibly could. But a lot of them, it's like, no, this is a point in time. This is this is what it is right now. This is what we see. Um, I do know our load map from the, that that um, the 2021 program was based off of did not include the code change that occurred um, that affected this year. So we were being held to a savings assumption far, you know, beyond what what we actually were going to be able to achieve based on that residential code change. So, I mean, that, that, that does leave a little bit of a scratch in your head, like, okay, well, I, <laughs> I, I, I can't achieve it according to the potential. I can't actually achieve all of that because it didn't even take into account that, you know, there were going to be far less residential gas homes than, than planned. Um, so it, it is to, to your point, Mike, that's an excellent point is it's kind of a, um, it, it's a, you know, do I go this direction or do I go this direction with it? Or, or do we just come think it's completely aside and the CPA can not account for those anyway? Um, so, yeah, I, 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 like I said, I'm not, I'm not stuck on any specific process, but I think we need to have the conversation and then move forward with what yeah. from that regional level makes the most sense. Um, yeah, no, that, that's, that's a really good point, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. Th yeah. Th thanks for bringing that up, Mike. It, it's an, yeah, it's an interesting way to frame it. And I, I sort of wonder if, you know, as we move forward and, you know, you get more product cut type of savings in the market for, you know, market transformation efforts that aren't, you know, codes and standards related, um, that that, you know, as those programs sort of ramp and grow, maybe those, maybe then we sort of can say, hey, you know, we take, we can take that into consideration in the BCP when that's more a little more, I don't want to say predictable, <laughs> but, you know, versus, you know, kind of a code change that that kind of happens and it, you know, it's always impossible to predict, uh, you know, what, what will and won't happen in codes and standards. But um, yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is maybe, maybe the approach we take this year isn't necessarily the approach that is taken forever, right? Um, kind of how we think about it. Yeah, well, let's let's start with the conversation. Yeah, and then um, we'll we'll kind of go from there. I mean, I don't know. I would say, barring additional feedback, we probably, uh, to Mike's point, do it how we have in the past. Um, I, I still, in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, we 
we have the savings we put in the effort for the last what eight years with Nia it seems mm-hmm. like we should be able to claim some of them but I mean maybe we claim them in a different way too it's it's the credits there either way you look at it for Nia um but uh ultimately I'm looking at my goals <laughs> yeah no I mean goals, it's so. yeah ultimately the savings sort of yeah I'll go back to the funders right so yeah yeah well, exactly. yeah freight payers right to the customers exactly but, yeah yep. yeah uh, I, I really yeah go ahead Heather thank you okay yeah Heather from UTC here um questions for Peter actually real quick the first is, um, if you don't mind, Peter, sorry for oh, putting no, on the spot. Um, I'll do my best. Great. Uh, so codes and standards, unpredictable. Um, what Mike was saying made me want to ask, you know, um, a, a, and the fact that you said an independent evaluator comes in and sees, mm-hmm. evaluates, like, would this have happened if we hadn't funded it for various things? So. Is there a, and I'm I'm very new to NIA stuff, is is there a degree to which, um, uh, how to put this, um, we can say that codes and standards would have happened without sort of NIA support? Um, or is it pretty clear that like, this is a NIA thing that NIA has made happen, and as such, it has happened through the funding of its membership. Yeah, yeah. Um, so th- that's that. Yeah, I, that's sort of the exactly the thing from what I understand um, that the independent, you know, analysis does is they'll go through and they, you know, they'll they'll even look at emails like that were sent, you know, among the coordinating parties, um, you know, expert testimony, what what was used in the analysis to, you know, formulate the new code and, you know, what was provided um, to that group uh, and, you know, what what Nia and the funders provided. Um, so to really sort of get a, hey, you know, A, it wouldn't happen or B, it might have happened, but, um, and really like weight it and say, you know, give it basically percentages um, of, of influence, if you will. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it, I was impressed by how the, level of detail that they went that they actually were going through emails um you know between uh you know just email chains and and that level of detail so i don't know if that quite answers your question it does i have one smaller follow-up question which is do you know if nia is planning on commenting at the open meeting on the 18th uh i don't know to be honest but i could find out um someone in our codes and standards group that would be great Thanks. Okay. Any any other thoughts, responses, questions for poor Peter, who's on the spotlight? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I really appreciated the conversation, Peter. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, um, of course. It's been something that you know we we said we would revisit later, and I, I think we said that like five six years ago. So <laughs> it's good to to you know circle back around and make sure that we're you know covering our bases and and really looking at what to, to your point, you know, how is the region changing how are we maturing how are we looking at these savings how are we looking at the opportunities and and code has changed as we know it will it's changed significantly so what what are the impacts of that and how do we need to adapt our our approaches based on that yeah no great no thanks for the time i appreciate it thank you (laughs) thanks everyone all righty um so uh i think the next item that we have here is just uh, seeing if there is an update on our Bellingham building audit, um, just because that was on our last agenda. Carrie, is there anything that we'd like to to share on the Bellingham building audit? Well, I can uh, I can just provide a, a brief um, update. I'm sorry, I thought you were going to ask Alan, so <laughs> it took me uh, 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 by surprise. We're going to meet next week. What we're looking at right now. Uh, we've 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 eliminated um, the uh, the option to replace the building, um, and so we won't we will not be replacing the building. We will be uh, looking at uh, a, um, a renovation instead, um, or, or we've we've uh, we've um, focused on the renovation as a as a way forward. And the environmental group uh, uh, in our company is um, is calculating the emissions associated with the design that the architect has submitted, and we want to be sure that 
you know, the, the way that we report and the way that we look at um, emission reduction is congruent, um, you know, between our official reporting and for the company and then, you know, what we're claiming uh, for this renovation and we'll be meeting next week to finalize that. So we're very, we're very close to closing um, the 1.5 uh, phase of the project, which is where it will sit until we uh, formally kick off uh, an additional phase, if in fact um, we we decide to proceed. Thanks, Gary. Didn't mean to throw you a curveball. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know I could talk about it all day. I, I, I know. <laughs> I love the um, the project, but that, yeah, that's, I think I've covered everything Ellen would want me to. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you covered that very well. And I, I was kind of waiting for Monica to call on me too, so. <laughs> but I, I, yeah, I think you covered the, the bulk of it, Carrie. Okay. I'm sorry, Alan. I looked through the list and I didn't see you on there and you're right on the bottom. I had to hit more, so I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan. Alan has 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 been um, really seminal to um, you know bringing this forward to this uh, to this extent. So um, very excited, and um, I just appreciate everything that Alan's done to this point. Yeah, it's it's been a, a fascinating process to really look at our um, at our building and see what some of the options are to to, to bring in, um, you know, the high efficiency and, and pair it with renewables and, and everything. So now, thank you. Thank you both. Um, all right. So it's just, you know, we're right towards the end of the meeting here. We've got our quarter two meeting is scheduled for April 20th. Um, quarter three is July 13th. And then we've got the quarter four is October 5th. Um, these times are, are scheduled kind of around some major deliverables that we have. If you look at the April one, um, as I was just mentioning with Peter, um, our annual report will need to be drafted and I think it needs to be in the advisory group's hands. Normally that would be by May 1st. Um, this year it might be by May 15th. Uh, and we'll certainly want to incorporate the NIA's feedback into it, either way you look at it. Um, July 13th, per the, the um, conditions documents, we're, we're going to need to start doing our um, uh, planning for the biennial conservation plan earlier in July. However, <laughs> that's not this July, that's next July. Um, that's 2023 is when we would start doing that. And that would actually happen around July 1st. Um, so we'd get information out to the advisory group, then we'd have the conversation mid-July and we'd be, you know, working on the back end. Um, October 5th is is um, typically when we would do the annual report or the conservation plan, um, we have now transitioned to a biennial instead of an annual. Um, so if there's any updates, we'll, we'll address that. Um, what we haven't actually put in here and what I'd like to really do from a timeline, timeline perspective is to look at what the IRP um, deliverables are going to be. That's, that's kicking off here really shortly. And um, I, I don't know if um, Brian or, or um, um, Devin or if anyone would like to speak to some of the, the upcoming timelines on the IRP side. I, I didn't put anything here in here and I didn't actually add it as a, a separate item, so I don't want to put you on the spot too badly. Um, but there's certainly some some specific deliverables that our group is going to have um, and, and coordinating with um, the resource planning team to make sure um, the messaging gets out there so that advisory group members have an option to, to weigh in as needed on these. Um, I'm not sure if Brian's on the call, so I can kind of just jump in really quick. This is Devin. Um, I guess I'm looking at a schedule that I believe is up to date right now. Some of these days I think may be slightly subject to change, but we're pretty confident about this. Um, we'll do a quick commercial, I guess, first of all, for our first technical advisory group meeting. We're currently looking at March 30th for that. Um, I believe that it's still going to be remote at this point, but I don't want to say with 100% definitive on that. Um, related to energy efficiency, our fourth technical advisory group is going to be when we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're doing 
both of our, our <laughs> this is going to be one of the first times in a while we're going to try to do both of our IRPs in the same year and we're going to layer some when appropriate. So obviously Washington and Oregon, there's going to be differences with energy efficiency, being that Monica and her team do a lot of that like work um, in Washington while ETO does it in Oregon. And so uh, currently I'm seeing on the schedule August 10th is when we're planning to have that Washington discussion. Um, so there's time there, but obviously still, you know, as Monica said, our teams work extremely closely together. So we're constantly kind of iterating with each other on some of those processes. Um, but August 10th is when we're planning on discussing some of those energy efficiency um, results and impacts on the total resource mix. Mm -hmm. And then in Oregon, that happens on August 24th. Pretty much all I've got. Thank you, Devin. Okay. Um, so I actually don't have anything else to offer, you know, three hours worth of me speaking. So, um, any, any final items, specific, uh, agenda items you'd like added to our quarter two meeting in April questions, comments, requests, anything of that nature? Uh, Monica, this is Carrie. Yes, Carrie, go ahead. Did we, uh, maybe want to close with a safety moment? We do want to close with a safety moment. Thank you. <laughs> I get involved with everything else, but I just lose track of it. <laughs> um, so Cascade has um, tried really hard to to make sure that we are um, including a safety moment in every one of our um, meetings. So I will um, maybe revisit um, what I spoke with my team about earlier this week. Um, there's I haven't actually seen it here, come to think of it, but they were calling for, for uh, more of the atmospheric um, river, <laughs> so more flooding options, or not options, I'm sorry, uh, more flooding incidents, um, possibilities. So, of, of course, as a safety safety note, you know, don't drive through standing water. You don't know how, you don't know how deep it is. Um, just be really cautious. Um, obviously, watch for any electricity if there's flooding issues. Um, you know, that, that kind of thing. I, I know uh, it kind of hits home at our office there in Bellingham, um, some of the flooding that occurred um, fairly recently. I mean, it, it, it was feet and feet deep right off the freeway. So um, certainly, you know, watch, watch your driving, um, be very cautious and, and um, you know, safety is the priority. So if need be, stay home. So thank you, Carrie, for the reminder. I appreciate it. Um, all right. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. Any I don't think there's anything else, so I'm going to say thank you so much. I'll give you back five minutes. <laughs> I know this is really a, a lot to, to digest. Um, it, it's a really intense three hours, but I can't tell you how much I appreciate the, the participation. I think this is one of the largest groups we've had um, on a call, so it was really great to have that kind of um, participation and just, you know, kick off the kick off the new year. And I, I look forward to the um, commission's meeting on, on the 18th to uh, really – dive into those conditions documents and get the biennial conservation plan set in stone. So thank you everybody.